morning, everybody, and <coughs> welcome to this meeting of the Audit uh, and Risk Committee. Um, are there any apologies? We have apologies from um, Councillor Austin White. Thank you. Next item, item two, urgent items and announcements. We have an urgent item in the form of a question. Sarah, do you want to read that? Yes, question? we've received a question um, from a member of the public, which is in light of the judicial review ruling in the West Midlands, which quashes the transfer of police and crime commissioner powers to its mayoralty. Has the government also conducted an illegal consultation in South Yorkshire for the transfer of police and crime commissioner powers? 65% uh, of consultees disagreed with the transfer of powers to the South Yorkshire mayoralty. What happens now? Right, I'll defer to the officer on my left, Gareth. Thank you, Chair. Um, the West Midlands challenge re related specifically to the West Midlands order. There has been no legal challenge to the South Yorkshire order, and as far as we are aware, government are proceeding with the transfer of functions to the next South, y South Yorkshire mayor following elections in May. So the legislation passed through the Lodge yesterday and is with the Minister for signing at the moment. So we have no reason to believe that this won't proceed. That, that accepted? Yeah, yeah, I see nod. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, items we consider in the absence of public and press. Are there any? No, thank you. Declarations of pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest. Yes, sir. Yeah, just the usual one that I'm a member of the uh, South Yorkshire Police Audit Committee as well, and obviously we're merging with them. I don't foresee any particular conflicts, but it's just for notice. Thank you. No further. Reports from questions by members. None. Thank you. I assume we've done questions from members of the public. Yeah. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 13th December 23. Correct record. Any matters arising? Nope. Quickly on. Um, I'm minded to move the external audit update to number eight. And sorry, Sean, demote your, the health and safety report uh, to item 12. So if we can take external audit update first, as I see Hassan is with us. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of an update uh, from ourselves, I uh, just want to, uh, first of all, kind of highlight that on the 6th of uh, December, um, the, um, the chief finance officers would have uh, received uh, correspondence from Stephen Reid, who heads up our government and public sector team within EY, setting out that as a firm, where in terms of you know, our priorities at this stage, and given the kind of issues and reset of local government to audit, we were focusing our capacity on uh, maximising the completion of historic audits. Uh, focusing our work on um, those organisations where work was substantially complete. Also, um, com the completion of uh, pension fund audits, because uh, that was our understanding in terms of uh, what was being proposed at that time in respect of uh, potentially the consultation that had yet to come out on uh, VFM reporting and where feasible on the uh, planning of 23-24. Uh, Audits. Uh, since then, uh, DLUC, um, the NAO, have uh, kind of have issued their kind of consultation in respect of the uh, addressing the uh, backlog of uh, outstanding uh, outstanding audits and uh, arrangements to uh, reset the uh, local government to external audit market. As part of that, uh, they did uh, report that as at the um, end of December 23, the backlog of uh, audits across the um, country stood at uh, 771, and um, they set out proposals for legislative changes in the accounts and audit um, regs with uh, three stages. Um, the first uh, phase being a resetting involving um, the clearing of historic audits up to um, 
2023 uh, by the end of uh, September. Um, phase two recovery, which was introducing uh, backstop dates and phase three, the reform to address uh, systemic challenges in the local audit market. As part of uh, phase one, it's uh, been outlined that there's um, it's, there's an expectation that there will be uh, a number of uh, disclaimed uh, audits um, in in respect to to, in, to address the, uh, the to reset the audit uh, audit market and for ourselves in relation to the 22 23 um, audit year then on the hour it's anticipated that we will be disclaiming the 22 23 um, financial statements uh, opinion and but we will be uh, completing our VFM uh, work, which is in progress at this moment in time, looking to get a draft of that uh, report out in April um, to officers based on the work that we've uh, undertaken uh, to date. Um, the consultation has uh, concluded. Uh, members of the uh, committee may well have uh, Kind of attended uh, various uh, roadshows that the FRC and the NAO have uh, and um, and DLUC have uh, have held. Um, I understand that there were in the order of uh, 240 uh, responses to the consultation. Um, you know, yourselves, you may well have uh, been one of those uh, kind of uh, organisations that have responded to the uh, consultation uh, processes. Um, the the output from the consultation is scheduled to be put forward um, to a liaison committee uh, meetings, my understanding, in uh, the middle of April in order to agree a way uh, forward. Um, once we um, are aware in terms of the next steps and uh, guidance that uh, we, we expect to be coming from the uh, FRC um, in response to a number of uh, points that have been uh, raised uh, we will uh, reflect on what that uh, what, what, what that means and what the next steps are for um for you know concluding our work on 22-23 happy to take any questions if there are any thanks for that update um so one sort of question v vfm for 22-23 is there anything we need to know about at, at this stage um uh, Liaison with the internal, the, the incoming auditor, external auditor. Obviously, if you're not doing work on 22, 23, that will give them some considerable issues in terms of opening balances for 23, 24. Are you going to be able to give them anything for any assurance on that? Equally, they're likely to have to do more work in 22, 24 because you haven't done 22, 23, which will incur us in additional fees. I assume because you're not doing um, work on our opinion for 22-23, we will see a significant reduction in the fees for 22-23, which at least will be some compensation for the 23-24 fees. Thank you. Thank you. So, taking those, uh, I'll take those points in uh, in, in reverse in, in relation to the 22-23 uh, uh, fees. Uh, PSA have you know, so the, the fees are the responsibility of uh, PSA in terms of what they set. So any any variations from the scale fee as set by PSA have to be um, approved by PSA. PSA have said that um, following the consultation they'll be communicating to. Uh, local gov government bodies to outline uh, what the fees uh, will be in relation to audits, which may uh, where the you know, where the opinion may be disclaimed. So I expect that you'll be hearing uh, from the uh, PSA in terms of the fee implications. Uh, I would I would expect there to be a reduction, but that's uh, you know, but that's not. Um, but as I said, the the matter for the fees are uh, are, are for the PSA. Uh, in relation to uh, the 23-24 um, audit, and that is a kind of question that's been raised um, as part of the consultation. What does it mean for opening balances? Um, and I kind of outlined earlier that we're waiting to hear from the FRC in terms of uh, in terms of guidance on on that one. So the uh, the, the the sectors are waiting for that guidance, uh, and uh, undoubtedly it's going to be. Uh, an area of uh, focus, um, but wait to see what the uh, what what comes out there in terms of any guidance for auditors uh, who are picking up a you know, a um, 
an audit where the um, where the uh, opinion has been uh, disclaimed within the uh, local government uh, context. And then in relation to our 22-23 VFM work, so the work is uh, ongoing at this moment in time, looking to uh, conclude on that. And uh, we will kind of, uh, firstly, if there are any issues, uh, kind of raise them with officers and then uh, report back to the committee after that. heard a lot of officer reports over the years and you don't seem particularly happy to be presenting this particular one um, I ju and it, it just seems to be a complete shambles so I just wonder now just chance to say where do you think uh, the you know what's your view of this the problem um, and what recommendations would you pass on for the future, what representation have you made about uh, uh, the, the the process? So, I never um, started out in terms of uh, into uh, external audit with the aim of uh, not completing uh, not completing an audit. So it's not a position which uh, you know personally I'd uh, like to like like to be in. The uh, reasons for why the whole uh, market you know, the whole kind of market is in the position that it's um, that it is in has been kind of uh, set out in a, in a number of uh, reports uh, in you know, into the uh, state of the uh, local audit market to do with uh, um, to do with increased uh, you know, increased regulatory uh, requirements to do with uh, capacity within the uh, external audit uh, market to do with uh, attractiveness of the uh, profession to do with uh, you know, complexities in terms of some of the arrangements that uh, local authorities are are engaged in, uh, be they commercial activities or um, you know, same significant, uh, significant uh, you know, complex um, you know, group structures as a, as a whole kind of myriad of, uh, kind of, re of reasons that have contributed to the position uh, which uh, you know, which the the whole market has uh, found itself in, and um, and some of those kind of issues are are outlined within the uh, consultation documents, and as I said, have been outlined within a number of reports that have uh, been uh, been prepared. And in order to, uh, you know, the point of the consultation in terms of uh, resetting the local government audit, it's it's um it's been. Uh, it's been outlined within the, um, the proposals to take uh, to take the um, system forward has been outlined in the uh, the, the three phased approach um, that has been that has been consulted on. It just seems to me that we're heading in the direction of a resetting of the reset. Uh, I just wonder what you feel about that. How confident the reset is going to well reset things. Yeah, um, I think if you, you know, the when the when the when the reset was uh, was first um, was first uh, outlined, it was in the summer of uh, summer of last year. I think uh, ideally the timetable might have uh, been earlier than it is for this year in terms of uh, taking things forward for 23, 24 onwards, and uh, how confident or how confident um, of uh, d delivery in line with uh, with set timetables and set backstop dates. I think that's uh, probably a question for your yeah, for your incoming auditors uh, for KPMG in terms of how confident they are. Th thank you for those answers. I I I'm conscious that as and when we get a disclaimer on our accounts, members of the public will will look here rather than nationally or, or our external auditors. Just for the record, can you confirm that one, these are national problems, and two, these are not issues that we could have done anything about in terms of the 22-23 opinion here, just so we've got that on record as and when we get members of the public um, shouting at us for having our accounts disclaimed and waving their hands around and making all sorts of... Um, allegations on Twitter or X or whatever. I think it is a it is a national issue which is kind of uh, highlighted by you know by the fact that there's been the consultation uh, 
process that's um, that's current that, that has recently been concluded and um, and set out in that consultation sets out the um, you yeah, know the, the national position as I said uh, earlier yeah you know, as at the end of December 2023 uh, DLUC were reporting that there were 771 um, outstanding audits at that that particular point in time in terms of the uh, disclaimer opinion the wording of the disclaimer opinion has yet to be um, has yet to be agreed. I anticipate that it will uh, quite clearly outline the the reasons uh, for the uh, for the disclaimer. So it will be, you know, I expect it will be uh, referring to, um, you know, referring to the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the reset of the local government uh, market. Uh, but one, once we have um, a form of what that uh, what that opinion will be, we'll be sharing it uh, with, uh, with with officers. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be. It sh it should make clear that um, the context of disclaimer, in terms of national, in terms of the kind of positions facing the uh, um, the audit market, as opposed to issues that have arisen as part of uh, our work with um, yourself yourselves directly as an organisation. Thank you. So, in plain English, it's not our fault. In terms of this the disclaimer, yeah, no, it's not. Uh, it's not actions that uh, that you've failed to um, to undertake that's resulting into into that disclaimer. Thank you. Can we make sure we minute that, please? And just to reinforce that, I was on the um, <coughs> webinar by DLUC um, a month or so ago, and there were 240 people on there, all with the same issues nationally. Uh, so it is clearly a national issue. It's not just us. It's uh, it's a national issue. And at the same time, Mr. Brinkley, we did make, for, for your comfort, if it is, we did make clear that uh, companies would only be paid for the work that they had completed. So the bill should be proportionate. Sorry, Chair, could we just be clear then? The very helpful that you describe the wording <coughs> will be there, but is the choice of words the auditors yourselves, or will you be after consultation with ourselves, or do we have to rush this through government? Uh, the choice of wording will be uh, for ourselves because it is uh, our our opinion uh, but we will be sharing that uh, wording before it's uh, before it's issued thanks for the clarification thank you chair um i, I guess just uh, on behalf of the authorities uh, we've also placed an unknown uh, relative dissatisfaction with where we've ended up um in this process um government set incredibly challenging deadlines for the completion and publication of the 22 23 accounts the part a lot of officers within this authority under a lot of pressure um, to get um, documentation in put together in good order and published um, only for it not to be audited so this is a pretty suboptimal place for us to end up but uh, dislike the saying but we are where we are and um, we await the clarifications from government over how KPMG as our new audit partners will will manage this situation and we'll work with them as best we can um, to ch try and get things done as quickly as possible so that we can get the right level of oversight and scrutiny back to the committee. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for the efforts of officers in the preparation of the 22-23 accounts and I have some level of assurance um, around those documents because of the significant work that was undertaken in the last financial year to review the balance sheet um, on the integration with the passenger transport exec. So, this isn't a great place for us to be, but as um, the, the external artists has pointed out, this is not a problem that originated in South Yorkshire. Um, we are very much on the receiving end of national issues, but we are looking forward to getting back on track and getting back into the usual swing of things with, um, with the new audit partners. So, thank you, Chair. Yeah, can I, can I just endorse that? I mean, the, the fact that we're not shouting at about this at this meeting is just that we're accepting that there's nothing we can do nationally but we are obviously you know wholly unhappy with where we've ended up there's just nothing anyone around this table or on the screen can do uh, about the situation now yeah i think it's clear that we've made all the representations and we've done all the shouting that we can in the past and this is where we've ended up 
along with a lot of other people. So, as the saying goes, it is what it is. Uh, it's just um, one final point. Um, Owen um, Campbell, our new Assistant Director of Financial Services, has been in touch with PSAA about the um, fees question in particular. So we've, we've already started to make representation with PSAA, and we've got a conversation lined up with them about this in the coming week. Okay, any more? Any more? No? Thank you very much. It seems to make sense to move to KPMG now. <laughs> So in terms of our planning work for the 23-24 financial statements audit, which will help deliver the completion of the external audit plan, progress has been made and progress continues to be made. Our initial anticipated deadline for production and delivery of the external audit plan was the end of this month. Um, however, we are completely aware of the conflicting and competing priorities that exist uh, at the authority, including the close down of historic audits in a chronological order as well as the various strategic and business as usual operational um, workloads demands it on management and therefore we're trying to be as flexible as possible because we are committed to getting this back on track and we've set a revised deadline for completion of our audit plan of the end of April. We have been having very open, proactive and um, very uh, useful ongoing conversations with management about the delivery of the outstanding information and documentation requests and we've been assured that we will receive the this outstanding information in the next week or so that will allow us to meet that revised deadline and publication of our external audit plan. Um, it is important that that work does get completed before the end of April otherwise there will be a knock-on impact in terms of when we would be able to start the final accounts audit. That being said, we have been holding various conversations with management to ensure a, a no surprises approach to the process. We've already resolved a number of technical accounting issues that would impact the accounts, which will help save time later on down the line. And I suppose to echo uh, the colleagues on the, on the call, we're awaiting the outcome of the legislation to be passed to really truly understand the nature and level of work that would be required on the open imbalances as well as when we would be legitimately able to start the audit um, in, in terms of w would we be able to start before uh, the disclaimer opinion is signed or would we have to wait until the date that that, that disclaimer opinion was signed on. So there's some technical elements uh, to be resolved nationally, however obviously any changes or any dramatic um, as it was updates from what we understand will be the process, we'll obviously come back to the committee and let you know as soon as possible to make sure that everyone's on the same page and we're on the same timetable going forward. Sorry to put you on the spot, James, but in terms of resourcing then, given all the problems we've had in the past, um, how confident are KPMG that they've got the resources to do this work? Yeah, I suppose the simple answer is very confident. Um, since we knew we were coming into this uh, contract, uh, we've been staffing up in terms of bringing on additional bodies in terms of apprentice, graduates, and experienced hires. We have a detailed resource and plan in place for different scenarios in terms of whether we need to start in July, whether we need to start slightly later. And so we have a, a role and resource pool to be able to undertake this audit. We've got our core team in Molly and James who are continually working on this audit to make sure that the plan is up to date. They'll be involved throughout the process and the additional staff will be added as and when needed. That's very encouraging, thank you. That's it, any more? Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Uh, where shall we go to now? It's a bit of a random agenda today, isn't it? Um, let's get health and safety out of the way. Sean? That's got you, hasn't it? No, I'm sure you were prepared anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see updates in uh, what we've presented in the, in the pack for everything, but there's an update from the uh, French Gate incident, if you want me to go through that. Just, just quickly, yeah. Yeah, uh, middle-aged guy, as you know, uh, stumbled on the stairs, 8th of October. He, he slipped from the middle of the staircase on an escalator that wasn't working. It turns out the escalator, through uh, chatting to the uh, manager of the French Gate Centre, the 
the usual protocol is to turn that escalator off from 7 p.m. until 15 minutes before the first service the following morning. So that escalator had been turned off deliberately. The guy had gone down it uh, and stumbled halfway down, uh, obviously uh, getting injuries as he'd done that. The, the member of the public, it turned out, was intoxicated at the time when he went down. The escalator was fine, other than that it had been turned off deliberately by the centre. Uh, update on, on the, the chap involved. He's still, as we stand today, still receiving medical treatment uh, via Doncaster Hospital, I'm, I'm led to believe. But he's OK. But he's still receiving treatment. Again, that escalator now is broken. Just, just for the record, it, got, it was uh, broken in February of this year and is due to be reopened mid-April, but that, that had got no bearing on, on what had happened back in October. So was the liability found to be on the pedestrian or the authority? It, it's, it's still up for debate, I'm told. Uh, I, I spoke to the manager of the French Gate on m Monday, and he, he's still in, there's legal claims going ahead with that at the minute, and they're, they're, they're trying to decide, but it's turned off due to lack of footfall after 7 p.m. There's no shops open in the French Gate, there's no very little traffic, so they turn it off. Uh, the manager has presented the last, I think he said, five years of footfall data from 7 p.m. to the insurers to show that they are quite within the rights to turn that off due to saving electricity and, and it not being used. So liabilities, it's not clear just yet. And it would otherwise operate as a normal staircase? Yeah, it's just a normal yeah. staircase, yeah, which is in, in, in as we know, the, the treads on, a, on an escalator yeah. are quite wide, they're wider than the normal. There is a lift, uh, at the, at the, really at the side of the escalator, and there's another staircase just to the side of the escalator as well. So there was other means of getting from top to bottom other than using the staircase, that, that escalator. Yeah. Right, Constable, your report? Yep. So it's just as being quick, isn't it? <laughs> uh, is there any reaction to that report, yeah? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report, uh, Sean. Um, are there any lessons we need to learn from the incident at Doncaster that affect our operations elsewhere, where we've got our infrastructure directly adjoins other infrastructure, including like Meadow Hall Centre, where that, I think, comes into the bus station, into the interchange there, and there's places like Rodwin as well. In, in terms of escalators, you're thinking specifically? Not just escalators, but just managing that interface where somebody goes from ours into another uh, operator's infrastructure or vice versa. <laughs> Footways, etc. Yeah, footways. It, it, to, to, in, in, in my mind, it's a case of making sure that they're well maintained, they're clean, there's no trip and slip hazards in, in that, and it's, it's keeping on top of that being mindful of weather conditions and, and things like that. Just the, the report shows that slips and trips, for example, between October and end of December have increased slightly, but that's due to bad weather um, and things like that. It's, it's maintenance, making sure we are maintaining, making sure we are doing our monitoring checks as well, and making sure everything's working as it should be. Thank you. And then finally, in terms of the uh, management reporting, it's good to see that we're going to get Doncaster's stats included in the report. What has been the problem with the database? Why we can't just add uh, Doncaster in? Uh, in terms, is it the way we collect the data? Is it lack of functionality? Because I'm concerned that as the responsibilities of PC, of the uh, NCA expand into the PCC, etc., the author might be doing on bus franchising. If we've got to add more locations in, to our responsibility. Have we got management information systems that are fit for purpose, or do we need to look more broadly at how we manage data? We, we, we're currently looking at having new systems in place. I know uh, Michelle's discussed this with Gareth that will do a clearer reporting lines for us. Uh, we, they're currently looking at uh, violence and aggression and antisocial behaviour which will give us better trends. I think that's April, I think Michelle said to me, but it, it, it needs a bit better system to pick these stats up so we can report them clearer. 
Thank you. Uh, so the answer to your question is, do we need more information on better systems? Yeah. If I just add, um, yeah, as as um, as we've said, that within the um, the health and safety business plan that's been prepared for the new year, there is there is a request for um, a, a better sort of automated system to produce the management information which we've committed budget to. So that will come forward in the new year. Thank you very much for your report, Sean. Sorry to throw that on you like that, but I thought I'd get it in and I'd get back to the general thrust of the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. you did well. <laughs> uh, and next item, nine, tram mobilisation update. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Melanie Corcoran, the new Exec Director of Transport. Um, so just wanted to give you an update on this one. We do have some slides. Excellent, thank you. So in terms of just an overview, we'll do a quick recap on the previous meeting and what we discussed last time. We'll look at the, the business plan for 24-25. We'll look at transition since the last meeting. Um, we're on the next slide, please. And then we'll look at transition day one, um, critical items in progress. And then let's have a look at milestones to day one as well. We do have a countdown to the, the start, the, the, the handover of the tram. Um, at the time these slides were written, it was nine days to go. It's actually less than 40 hours to go now to the transfer. Um, so yes, it's very much uh, top priority and, and focused in our minds. So next slide, please. So at the last meeting, we talked about the Siftel board structure. So Siftel being the new company. We talked about the framework for the business plan um, and a 100-day plan, year one, longer-term plan. So I'll come on to uh, some of the headlines for that. And then we gave you progress updates against the key milestones. So again, I can update on where we are now that we're so close to that transition date. So on the, the next slide, please, um, let's have a look at the headlines on the business plan. So we've got six operational goals, operational compliance, so operational and regulatory compliance, safety, safety without compromise, so delivering a robust, safe and reliable tram service. We've got revaluing the network, so restore confidence in the tram network. Prioritising our people, so foster a safe and vibrant place to work for our colleagues. Providing value, so providing value for money to the taxpayer and to passengers. And then sustainable travel, enable sustainable journeys in South Yorkshire. So in terms of assurance and the assurance framework, we've looked at what Simca will, will have oversight of, also what the SIFTL board will be looking at and covering, and then also the role of this committee. So the proposal here is that we extend your, your remit to cover SIFTL as a sub um, you know, sub-organisation and subsidiary of the, the MCA. And your role will be then to agree the internal audit plan, receive internal audit reports and monitor delivery of actions and then look at reviewing strategic risk register and the proposal is that the SIFTL director will come to these meetings to present performance reports against the business plan and internal audit reports and to report risk. Um, so you'll have a, a close relationship with um, what's going on in terms of the tram company. So on the next slide, transition and, and headlines since the last meeting. So on the governance side, we've got a, a 24 25 revenue budget that has now been approved for the new operating company. We've got a business plan for SIFTL that's been endorsed. And we've had a shadow board that have been meeting monthly since December. And then in terms of the transition for customers, employees, suppliers, stakeholders, we've got 93% completion now of having supplier contracts in place, and the majority of those will be ready in the next week. We've got new staff accommodation that's been identified at East Parade, and there's refurbishment ongoing. We've got a new retail app that's been developed, and it's currently in testing. We've got 90% of training complete now on the new handheld ticket machines that are going to be introduced for conductors on the trams. 
branding, we've looked at changing signage at, at depots and TUPI letters have been issued. There's been various engagement sessions with staff and we've obviously been working with HR and payroll in terms of that transfer. And then ORR engagement on the safety case. So this is office for, for road and rail and we have received our safety certificate to operate tram train as well, which was something that we'd been uh, waiting for. And then if we can go on to the next slide in terms of day one critical items. So the, the payroll issue we've been looking at and we've been working through with, with payroll and, and staff on that. We've also got data migration and training operations for day one plus and the approach for that in place and new starters and how that's going to work as well. Supplier assurance and com on compliance. So new compliant process developed for day one. ORR safety case, as I've just mentioned, insurance in place, innovation of the access agreement with Network Rail, the accommodation, which I've mentioned on East Parade, and IT installation and, and cutover. So they're all in progress. And then we've got various milestones that we reported on last time. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of where we're up to, most of these are now green, as you would expect to see um, so close to the transfer. Um, and the current forecast dates are either as set out originally or are coming in um, before that date. If we move on to the next slide, there's a few that are highlighted in grey. So they have gone back from the original planned date. So setting up the new operating agreement and the link to the business plan, that will be complete this month. Similarly, uh, procurement and contracts, they will be in place this month as well. So there's just been the last few of those to come through. Everything else on track. And then if I can go on to the, the third one of the milestone slides. Um, so again, a couple more in grey which will be completed this month. So looking at IT, corporate system, go live, and development of the TSY website and the app rollout. So they will be going live this month as well. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you for that. And obviously there's been a huge amount of hard work getting us here, thank you. So can I just clarify, the, the insurances, at one point I'm, I'm I marked down, you'd said in place, and then you said in progress. So which which is it? Because obviously we need those in place in day one. And I suppose, I, th I can see there's a number of other things like finishing off the two pin payroll and data migration, et cetera. Is there anything critical for now, two or three days time when we, when we you know, uh, go live? And, and, you know, is your overall view confident that we're going to be able to go live and, and the public aren't going to notice any difference and we're going to be fully insured and have all the operating licenses? Yeah, we, we have got the insurance in place. Mike, did you want to come in on that one? Um, yeah, so <coughs> I, I, I'm um, speaking to Chief Legal Officer Steve Davenport at lunchtime um, just to put the final uh, knockings together. But essentially, yes, we have placed um, insurance at, um, and agreed with our insurance broker, Aon, for all the different uh, covers that we require. The main one that was um, important for us is um, the Office of Road and Regulation, which um, uh, Rail, sorry, which Melanie referred to, requires cover of 155 million pounds per incident. That was the absolute critical one, and we've we've agreed every single layer up to 155 million, which was challenging, but we've we've got that in place. So really, it's just the we're just waiting for Eon to raise the invoice. But as far as we're concerned, the policy cover is, is good to go for Friday. Thank you. And then just in terms of Tupi, yeah, everything is progressing. Um, we've had engagement sessions with staff. Um, obviously, they're currently not our employees, but we wanted to be having those discussions before that handover date. Um, and then from Friday, they, they will be um, CIFGAL employees. And your overall confidence we're going to be okay for Friday? Yeah, we, we, we're almost there. There's just a few little things to sort out, as we've, as we've highlighted, but there's nothing serious and um, yeah we're, we're on track to to have the uh, a smooth handover on Friday thank you so um, a co tremendous amount of work has, has been done and thank you very much for getting it, it all done
just on the real nitty gritty thing, because you said about training on the new systems. I don't know how different the ticketing system is, uh, but sometimes that, it's at that point when you've got somebody saying, well, it's new, I haven't really had much practice. And is it more or less the same? Is it gonna work? I know it's hard to say, but we've had training. That's not quite the same. I was in a shop the other day and the uh, cashier was saying, why it's a new till system, we've had training, but where do I press this, where do I, f where do, where do I find this cheese sandwich type <laughs> stuff? So, that's it. Okay, yes. No, we don't sell cheese sandwiches on the tram, no, Would be a good idea, Chair. <laughs> Somebody up and down from the tram. So, 93% of the training had been completed. We are still doing training. The, the handheld machines are very similar to what they have now, only better. And I did overhear a conversation on the tram yesterday with two conductors saying how excited they were that they were going to get their new handheld machines. <laughs> so I, I take it from that, that they have done their training and they're very happy with them. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo what Melanie's just said. Um, so I've been speaking to one of the um, ops leads on the tram transition team who's been personally running the training sessions on uh, the last few Sundays with the conductors. Um, so for my part, I've been involved because I've, I've, I've been arranging with, with size all the kind of compensation for taking those conductors out of business to have the training. And I've also seen the, the tail end of the transactions, test transactions going through hitting the new SIFL bank account to show that it, it's all working. So from my point of view, I feel reassured that that's good to go. Um, in terms of other systems, as I said, the retail um, handheld apps is the, is the most important one to have ready for day one, but there are also back office systems that we want to make sure are, are working. So um, we've got Sage 200, the finance system, where um, user acceptance testing is about to be signed off in the next couple of hours. and. Um, I have just shown the new HR people, including the new senior HR manager and her colleague, into Steve Davenport's office so they could have their training on the new HR system, which is very straightforward. And, um, and also the head of finance and commercial this morning has also had his training on the new Barclays account. So it's all happening thick and fast right now. And yes, it seems like it's up to the wire, but this is all part of the plan to do it according to the schedule. the other end of this um, we, we've set up a, a limited company to run the system vaguely I seem to remember that there was all sorts of difficulties rules and regulations about local government running a company maybe there aren't any now and that it's a straightforward share issue and that the mayor or the authority is going to hold the, sh the share capital and voting rights and that sort of thing and it's <coughs> but otherwise it runs just like a limited company yeah i think you might be referring to part five companies so i seem to remember problems with these in the uh, in the early noughties as well in, in um, distance, yeah I, I i think what we're not doing is directly competing um in the in the market because it's only one tram system we're running a public service in in south yorkshire um, the company is wholly owned by by the MCA um, and the majority of directors are um, MCA employees as well so it's very much controlled by the public sector but delivering a public service on our behalf. Thank you Chair. Um, just to add to what Mike and Melanie have been saying for members of the committee, uh, transport working groups worked very closely with the project team and Zoom sort of were put on top of a lot of work to deliver this. It's a really complex project and if it gives any uh, confidence to the committee, um, we discussed with the project director where we were on Monday afternoon and he was very confident indeed. And as Ian said, culture I think is one of the important things about taking on board a new organisation and the project team spent a lot of time trying to change the culture there and it's good to hear that they are excited with um, what they're getting uh, and there's a lot of effort put into improving accommodation as well as uh, making people feel valued 
uh, and ensuring that there's going to be the last thing we really do need to get is premium pay to get all that in place because otherwise you don't have your ORR licenses and you can't operate the tram train uh, and I think once that's done the project director was very confident that we were there as with any last minute project there's things to do things crop up but they've got people on standby to work through the night from Thursday into Friday to deal with any problems as they come up so it's the forum affidavit is working right now uh, thank you chair um, yeah endorse what Paul's saying the, the other key points to note is that um, as well as obviously having the budget approved which was one of my main concerns that was sorted back in January the other key concern that we addressed last week as a formality and through the city board was the um, the general financing arrangements for the company we had the plan we just needed it ratified so uh, to reassure members we put SIPL in sufficient funds that it can cover its immediate working capital requirements and also for the first quarter we've got an arrangement in place that will allow SIFTA to put in request to the MCA to draw down further uh, as this committee are probably aware from the Treasury Management strategy, but we can cover this later if necessary, that the MCA board has approved um, the revenue loan support that will give us more than adequate cover to um, provide a credit facility to SIFTL um, should it arise. So things like paying up front for the insurance, sorted, that the cash is in place, dealing with the elements of the transition agreement with SISAL, um, to bring in stocks and share um, stocks and spare parts to purchase them that's covered mm -hmm. dealing with March payroll covered and dealing with any immediate um, day one month one quarter one costs again all covered I, well, I assume the two peer arrangements are going smoothly at the end of the day it's people who make things work so if they're happy, you can be more confident. Yeah, yeah that's right, Chair. Yeah, thank you. That's good, thank you. All content? Thank you very much for your report. Obviously, we'll not wish you the best of luck, we'll say break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, next, the, oh, you're on again, Melanie. Bus reform. I am. It's, it's the other exciting uh, area of transport at the moment as well. So on bus reform, um, just to give you an update on this one, last week the MCA board took the decision to move to the next step in the, the process of the franchising assessment and move into bus reform. There, there is quite a detailed um, legislative um, process that we need to go through. Um, a decision was taken completing on the completion of the draft assessment. So the operating models for bus moving forwards are the current position is an enhanced partnership where we work in partnership with our operators and that's been seen in the assessment as our reference case. So that is our current state. There's then an option to look at deepening that partnership, enhanced partnership plus. And there's also, we looked at a number of options around franchising. There were four variations with different asset ownership options. The MCA assessment concluded that franchising option B, which was for fleet and depots to be owned by the MCA, is the preferred option. Um, but we will be working on both options as we go through an independent audit um, that will be looking at this. And as we move forward with it, we will be looking at Enhanced Partnership Plus and we'll be looking at franchising options as well. Um, so in terms of, just a, a recap in terms of the bus market, so over the past decade, bus mileage has declined by 42%. We are definitely in a cycle of decline in terms of, of bus. In 2012-13, 13% of the network mileage was supported by public funding. And by next year, this is going to have increased to 24%. That's a lot of the network to be funding without actually being able to control the network. Hence why the proposal to do something different in terms of running the bus network. Um, the passenger journeys per head of population for South Yorkshire are, are dipping in the same way that they are nationally. And percentage of bus services operated in terms of reliability also dipping. So again, 
time for us to, to change the way that we look at this. We've also got an opportunity with BSIP, which is the Bus Service Improvement Plan, to set out our ambitions for the network. Um, and just to put this in context, South Yorkshire gets just over £10 per head of population of government funding towards buses. That compares with £40 in West Yorkshire and other MCAs such as Greater Manchester get roughly the same. So we are behind in terms of the support that we need to be putting into the network. So we will be setting out a level of ambition in the BSIP proposals um, to set out to government how we would plan to, to improve the network. Uh, we also have an ageing fleet. So our buses on average in South Yorkshire are 11 and a half years old with a 15 year life expectancy. That compares with a national average of about eight years old. So we've also got an older fleet, um, which means it could be uh, less reliable if it's, if it's coming towards the, the end of its, its life. And the impact of doing nothing is that we will end up um, in, in an upward trend of funding more of the network publicly without actually being able to, to, to control that network. So the, in, in terms of the options for franchising, the Enhanced Partnership Plus would build on the existing arrangements that we have with operators, but it would look at additional investment, interventions around network, fares and ticketing, fleet and branding, and it would still be operator controlled and any network changes would require approval and, and buy-in from operators. Um, franchising would give the M MCA strategic control over almost all of the South Yorkshire bus network. The, the MCA would be able to design, specify the <coughs> network, the route, the service provision, fare structures, pricing, ticketing, performance standards, and can also ensure integration with other transport modes, such as tram, that, that we've just talked about as well. So we could look at bringing those uh, modes together um, so that they're more integrated and, and do more for the, the customers in terms of, of getting where they want to get to. Um, so talked a little bit about both of those schemes. There's now certain stages that we need to go through. So we've done um, a draft assessment. That needs to be audited by an independent auditor, and we're in the process of appointing that auditor now. And then the, the decision will go back to the MCA with the results from the audit, asking them if they would then, having looked at the audit, they would like to proceed to consultation. And then after consultation, there would be another decision point where the mayor would be asked to make a final decision on which option we go with. So we're still looking at two options. We've got the independent audit and there's still a further process. So within the next 12 months, we would expect there to be a, a final decision on which, which option we're gonna go with. What stage, I think the, I'm right to think that the main change in the legislation was that um, the authority decides where the public interest lies in terms of uh, franchising. Um, so we're less susceptible to a legal challenge. Uh, but what's your ass assessment of the options for any le legal challenge, possibly from the, the operators? and that as a risk. Uh, and on the, in terms of the fleet, w is the intention that we essentially, we get a more reliable fleet by buying a reliable fleet. And so that the, basically the aging and less reliable fleet will be left in the hands of the basic stagecoach and first of the main operators uh, here, aren't they? Yeah, if I could just take the, the second point first on the fleet. Um, the, the idea would be to move to um, an EV fleet, but you wouldn't be able to do that on day one of a franchising model. You would have to, to roll that in over, over phases. Um, so it wouldn't happen immediately. And as vehicles became life expired, they'd be replaced with a, a cleaner fleet. So that's that's certainly the plan on there. The, the thinking behind having an option where the MCA would own fleets and depots means that it allows other operators to come into the market. It allows us to get some competitive responses from operators, but also it allows other players to come into the market if they choose to, because they're not 
having to have their own depot and fleet in South Yorkshire. Um, if we provide that, that's a more open claim, a, a, a more open opportunity for a number of operators. So that's the thinking um, behind the fleet. Sorry, can you just remind me what the first point was as well? Oh. It's about the a legislation. The, yeah, yeah. The, the principal change being yeah. between the Tyne and Weir case where Tyne and Weir, from recollection, the, the they fell at the legal challenge stage, having invested a lot of money in, fran in, in actually being a forerunner of franchising. Um, and I think that, that obstacle is less of an obstacle. I'm just, as a risk, I'm just trying to find out, am I right to think that? There, there is always a risk of a judicial challenge. And Manchester um, were in this position where they were forging ahead with, with franchising and there was a judici judicial challenge on the mayor's decision. Um, that is why we are following the legislation extremely carefully. We have external advisors that are advising us on how to go through this process and um, we are trying to minimise all opportunities for any challenge because we are following the legislation in a way that we feel you know, it is the right way to do that. I just, sorry, if I could add, add to that point, it clearly helps for us to not be uh, the first in the queue on that process because having seen Greater Manchester go through it, see the kinds of things they were challenged against, West Yorkshire as well are slightly ahead of us on this process. There is collective learning and sharing of information across combined authorities taking place on a very regular basis as to what the potential risk of some of these uh, issues might be. So I think you know we are in a good place in that regard to be forewarned and forearmed against the kinds of things people might try to uh, raise as a as legal challenge. Um, so at the Transport Working Group, I, I, I did raise the question, so there's, the, there's a financial risk for falling patronage, just slightly. You know, we want the bus service to improve. We, we may as well start out from, it's a fair argument to say it can hardly get worse. Let's, let's build upwards from, from here. But th there's a counterbalance that we're not paying out as much for concessions. And I was trying to work out at our meeting whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably a good, not a good thing, but there's a budget saving. And I was just trying to get a sense for whether you could balance the risk, the risk out, that there's a saving in one place and an extra financial risk in the other. Uh, so how could you comment on that, please? Yeah, that, that's right. So when we've got budgets um, set for concessions where potentially th there isn't the level of concessions that we budgeted for, potentially it does allow funding to go into enhancing routes. But at the moment, we are propping up routes that would have stopped. And we've got an opportunity with BSIF, with, the, with government funding, to look at enhancing some of those routes. Um, but yeah, we can look at how we balance out concessions and and supporting routes. I think, Ch Chair, if I could just add a, a, a brief point too. Um, concessions are, are a, in theory, a good way of getting money to operators, but it has to be on the principle of no better, no worse off, which is what concessions are there to do. But it's also non-targeted, so it just goes into general revenue with the operators, and therefore we have you know no ability to direct where that revenue might go to support services more generally. That's their choice. Tenders, clearly, we can do that, um, but we can only do that where they no longer choose to operate or where there is no commercial alternative. Um, but as we know, that comes at a premium because they put a, an operating and profit margin on the tender price that they specify to us. So those two things, whilst we absolutely treat them holistically in terms of the way that we look at a combined tender and concession cost and, and our budget implications from those two expenditures, um, they are still, you know, collectively don't give us the level of control that um, we would like and our ability to you know, direct that funding to the bits of the system that need it the most is still somewhat limited. Yeah, um, it, there's a couple of points and it's a really good bit of the conversation. So um, concession um, patronage has been falling over the last few years and we've taken four million pounds out of the concession budget and put it into the tendered services budget over the last couple of years and that has allowed us to support the network buying back routes that otherwise we would have lost. Um, I think Tim's point is, is really important though in that we are obligated to carry um, or to, to pay for the, the carriage of um, 
of people under the National Concessionary Travel Scheme. And the alternative is that we put money into tenders um, where we, we have budget surplus, but the, both options are a relatively inefficient way of putting money into the network in its totality. Franchise and offers us the opportunity to do things differently where we can take the money that we receive um, our currently budget for concessions and use that to support the network in its totality. So we will have to carry um, concessionary um, passengers but we can determine which routes we run at what frequency and so on. Um, so it becomes a much more efficient way of targeting your money at the, the places and the routes that really matter to us. Okay. Yeah, I'm right to think the inefficiency is in the fact that in, on con concessions, you, you, you're, you're spending your money on services that are popular and might run every few minutes. Yeah. And that's, that's a fact. And that's going in the pocket of the operators on services that were, they would run anyway, so to speak. And that's, I think that's the, the issue. Um, the, the only other observation I've got, may, maybe not for here, but um, anyway, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> but maybe not, but maybe for somewhere else. But it's just, I mean, to my understanding, belief, I am a keen supporter of the franchising system, is that the day after privatisation, bus services in South Yorkshire were on a downhill trajectory. Sheffield had gone from has gone from the most popular place to get public transport back in the day <coughs> to one of the least popular places to get up to get on a bus. Not all disaster occurred sometime after two thousand and ten. Just a couple of, qu of quick questions. You mentioned this is all supported by 350 million of, of CRSTS capital grant. Are we happy that that capital grant will still be forthcoming even if we have a change in government, um, which we might just have at some stage over the next year? And you also mentioned that we only get 10 pounds per head of, of funding in, in South Yorkshire, whereas West Yorkshire gets 40 pounds per head. Is there anything we can, do we understand why that is and is there anything we can do to, lobby government to improve our funding position yeah thank you in, in terms of crsts we have our funding letter we have the offer letter it sets out funding year by year so at the moment we have um no suggestion that any change in government would would alter that existing um funding agreement that's already in place um so we are pressing ahead with plans for for later years spend um in terms of the spend per head it, it's the, across the whole network. Um, so at the moment, BSIP does make a difference, but there's also the payments that are made to operators, there's the concessions, there's the money that we put in as well. Um, we will definitely be setting out a case within our BSIP programme. It needs to be submitted to government in June, and we will definitely be setting out a level of ambition that looks to try and get us on a similar footing to our neighbours. Okay, thank you. So I take from that that there is a risk that the CRST might disappear because it's in the government win, but we believe that risk is, is low. And on the BSIP, is there any chance that if we're unsuccessful in June, the following June when there might be a change of government who might be more inclined to be favourable to us, that we, we, we can have another go and try and see if we can get our funding levels up? Yeah, I mean, that is still an opportunity. We, we've got a good chance. To, to put our submission in for BSIP and to, to be able to articulate our level of ambition. So we will do that this year on the basis that, you know, we, we, we should get some award this year. Uh, we've got an indicative allocation for the next financial year um, that we've already got a good idea of, of the services that we would like to, to prop up, if you like, to, to maintain the network. But we've got ambitions to, to expand as well. So we will certainly be making a strong case. And, and you're right, when when whatever government comes in next time round, we have the opportunity again to lobby that government. Just a very brief point, if I could, Chair. Um, the 2024-25 allocation of BSIP, the revenue funding, DFT have made it very clear that's a non-competitive process in terms of that submission for the 12th of June. So um, as long as we get a BSIP refresh submitted and it's of you know the required quality, actually in terms of the ambition it sets out, it doesn't dictate 
in sort of the 24 25 allocation the amount of funding that we'll get what they have said is that it might inform what future allocations might look like so um, hopefully the FTA is slightly hedging their bets in saying it's a non-competitive process but might inform future levels of award so take that as, 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 as you will but certainly for 24 25 allocation it's just contingent on submission of the plan full stop Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 26 of the pack, the, the graphs of the financial case uh, moving towards franchising, Does, do those graphs assume any increase in revenue then from increased ridership? And, and how much? No, we assume patronage continues to fall. In the, in the business case. So we're taking a very prudent assumption within the business case now. Um, the, the price is forecast to in, increase in line with inflation, but overall patronage forecast to decline. So we think we're being quite prudent <coughs> in, in that assumption. Yeah, my immediate reaction is why would we be so prudent? If what we're looking for is to improve the bus service, won't we get an increase in journeys for the population? I, I guess the, the the, the important point about the external audit is proven affordability within a range of scenarios. So the, the business case that has been submitted to audit isn't a representation of where we would like to be into the future and where we would like our, um, our patronage to be, and we daily hope that it would increase. But we've planned based on known issues, um, and one of those known issues is the DFT national forecasts for patronage, which show declines on a national level into the future. So th this isn't a, a sort of business plan representation of where we would like to be and how we will get there, but where, where we think we will be and whether we can prove affordability, which we can even with um, declining patronage. But obviously reliability will improve, presumably. I certainly hope so, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <coughs> I was just thinking, the, the way, I may have misunderstood it, but one of the ways we were selling this was we wanted to improve the transport options in Edinburgh for South Wiltshire. And if you're saying that the numbers are going to continue to decline, that seems to go against what the main objective is. Yeah, I, I mean we have to use the T patronage forecasts. Okay. We, if, if we didn't use those forecasts, I, mean, I think we'd be accused during the audit of being over-optimistic and in our ridership numbers. So we take, take the national um, patronage trends and then assume that they continue to fall. Um, that would allow us to pass through audit um, on a, the affordability basis. Thank you, Sarah Martin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think the reality is, Paul, that we, um, whichever auditor is appointed to come in and kick the tires on this, we know from speaking to colleagues in Cambridgeshire, Liverpool, West Yorkshire and GM that they will home in on assumptions like this yeah. and that's what they're testing is how robust is your assumption. So they look at this one and, they, and if they think that we've been overly optimistic they will challenge that which will slow down the audit but also it will cause us to have to rethink whether we've got the business case right which is to back to Gary's point is why we've taken the most prudent assumption possible that we can link back to an acceptable source that can't be challenged by the auditor. No, that, that's fine, thank you. It's helpful uh, clarification. And um, one final question. Um, page 28, the help phrase sets out all the stages that we've got to go through. Um, what are we looking at? Something like two years before we're able to bring it in? We're, we're probably looking at 12 months from, from now for the mayor to be able to make a decision on, on one of the options. Um, and then there is a lead in time then to the developing the, the first um, procurement and, and going through the first tranche of, of, of a network if, if you were going down a franchising route. So that could be another 18 months from that decision point. Um, and I think Manchester took about four years to get from the decision point, but they, they were the front runners. And they've they've done the hard yards and, and learnt the lessons. So, as was mentioned earlier, you know we we can work with other MCAs to see what issues they faced and how we might be able to do some of this a bit quicker. Um, but 
you know, uh, 12 months from now for a decision and then 18 months to the first franchising is very quick. No, that, that's fine. Thank you for the clarification. I know when we've discussed this before in committee, uh, it's been made clear that one of our approaches might be to do this on a uh, piecemeal approach so that we don't make one massive mistake. We, uh, we can take it stage by stage, get it right, and then roll that out. So that's helpful to inform the time scale that we're, we're looking at. Yeah, just on that, there would be a number of procurements. Y you, would, you would launch a number of, of lots. You, you wouldn't do it all at once as for South Yorkshire. Um, I know West Yorkshire have got three different tranches. I think Manchester had three different tranches as well. Um, so, yeah, you would definitely do the procurement in phases. Thank you. Can I assume that the franchising will improve the service overall in terms of uh, routes and size of buses, for instance, with greater flexibility? It will definitely provide greater flexibility. If we want to enhance the routes and we want to look at like larger size vehicles, we would have to factor in the cost of that in running the network. So if, if franchising was an option that was taken, then we would take fare box revenue from the network, um, which means that if you are then making a profit on that fare box, you can reinvest that into the network and we would have to look at the financials of it in terms of whether we could expand the network to meet our ambitions, or it might be other sources of funding. So if it was something like BSIP, which isn't factored into the assessment now, that could benefit the network with e in either of the options, in either of the scenarios, because it's funding on particular routes. Um, but franchising itself, you would want to look at what's your cost envelope, can we maximise the network? Are there some routes that could cross-subsidise others? Do you want to rationalise some, some journeys on some routes? Whereas at the moment, we don't have any control over that. It, it's private operators who will come in and, and operate on a route, and, and they'll set the route. Yeah, I was just wondering, we're talking about a downward trend. What are we going to do to improve that downward trend? <laughs> yeah, so you, you can look at, you know, are, are there areas that currently don't have a service that, that you want to have a service? And there will be other areas that are over-serviced. Um, do you want to increase frequency? Do you want to extend the operating hours of the service? And we'd have to factor in all of those things and, and look at all of that. Um, but we should be defining the network that we want to see whether that's working in partnership with the operators on EP Plus or whether that's um, delivering a franchising system. Um, it, it, it's just this issue about the audit kicking the tyres and making certain we've made robust as assumptions and based on decline. I mean, the public reason why we didn't get much money from the government first time round pounds was our plans were unambitious and you might say well it's unambitious if you're planning a patronage to keep falling it will be understood that there's a there's a difference between uh, as it were a worst case robust audit and having an ambitious ambitious plan to grow patronage they won't get linked together in terms of how it's going to be assessed. So the, the, the assessment is, is, um, is comprised of the usual five, business, um, five cases, five dimensions within a business case, and the strategic case sets out the rationale um, for our franchising providing you with a, a, a foundation to deliver more, and control brings with it a, a plethora of benefits that um, Melanie has just been through, the, the opportunity to design a network that works for South Yorkshire rather than for operators, the opportunity to set frequencies, fares and so on, um, that really give you the, the, the full toolkit to, to run a service that works and is sustainable. The, the, economic, the financial case has been prepared in such a way as it's bulletproof, so yes, we have used um, the, the DFT national um, um, patronage trends to support that, 
but really the, the benefits are wrapped up within the strategic case and that does set out the rationale and that that, that, that is um, quite ambitious in what it's trying to achieve. One of the things that we have been able to prove is that we will be able to recover more lost services. So we have, uh, we have modeled on what we call the October network, which is the network that is in place today. In 2526, unless there is further government funding in the manner Tim has described, the, net, the network would have to contract because there would be less funding. We don't have the same level of reserves that we have done in previous years to support the network. So we would see a contraction in the network. So we, what we've been able to prove, subject to the, um, to the independent audit, um, agreeing with our assumptions, is that you can get that network back. So you can regrow it to where it is today. You recover the, the lost routes. Um, and you can do it in a financially sustainable way. So the business case in its, in its totality sets out the benefits of um, franchising and that's why it, it led to the recommendation it did within that. But the financial case, re recognizing that a fundamental test of this um, assessment is affordability has, has been set with a really quite a, a, a low bar in terms of what we are trying to achieve. Um, and that is simply sustainability. You have to prove that it's affordable. It's just, I guess, the way I look at it, we know for a fact that reducing frequency and putting up fares results in less passengers. You would think the reverse of it would happen. I think that's a fair assumption. The problem is with a, with a network that's on, based on profits for private companies is that the network can be ever shrinking to a profitable core, I guess, uh, and with a, without any intervention to to do the reverse of increasing reliability and having reasonable fares and having a more frequent service. That's what we're trying to do here, isn't it? Reverse the inevitability of the cuts that we've seen over the years. I don't think any of us <coughs> would disagree with that. Um, but we do want to improve the service for for riders, for the public. Um, but perhaps we have to jump through the hoops first and then improve the service. Yeah, I, I, I think that th <laughs> these are all really good questions and it, it, it <laughs> makes you think about all this. But I think the bit that we need to wrap our heads around is this is unlike a business case where we submit money into government um, with a, a promise of much better things to come um, um, and if only you give us some money we will be able to deliver X, Y, Z and the world will look rosier and that, that's almost in a sense to be so um, as, as Tim has described. The way in which we have approached the submission um, into the audit is largely shaped by the regulatory process and what the auditor is being asked to test. And the auditor is being asked to test the assumptions that we have used um, to determine that we why we think um, that the chosen option is the preferable option. So we're almost tailoring the homework to the process. And it's a slightly different process than you might be familiar with in terms of the usual sort of business case submissions into government. And the fundamental sort of test that we have to answer is that it is affordable because that is the significant hurdle at this stage of the process. So it, we have deliberately taken a very sort of dim view of the future because if you can get over that hurdle, you can then get into the, the more sort of expansionist um, and aspirational um, activity that we've, 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 has been described by people around the table. difficult one for politicians to accept when we have residents and travellers in our back all the time saying why can't we get from A to B on a bus yeah. um, but if it gets us to a point where we can start to improve that service then well, we have to do that <laughs> yeah. uh, okay if no further questions thank you very much for your report most welcome Thank you. Um, I, I have to leave at, at our break time to 
go somewhere else and and Dave will be taking over as vice chair. So what I intend to do now is to do item 14, something about a bit more, and take a break at that point, and Dave, you can continue from there. So, Tim. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, committee members will recall this audit on bus um, data quality uh, uh, came to the Peak's meeting. Um, there were eight actions that came out of, or eight recommendations that came out of that particular audit. Um, we met with RSM last week to review progress against those audit. Eight, um, there were nine specific data asks for supporting evidence. Uh, we provided evidence um, relating to six of the eight recommendations. They've now been confirmed as closed. Uh, there are only two remaining items uh, which are in progress. One which is in the relation to doing a gap analysis on the data. So we have done work on this um, and there's gap analysis data but there's further work to do in terms of completion of the NAFTA analysis. The other one which is a, um, uh, a potentially more expansive piece of work and uh, potentially even related to the previous item we've just been discussing which is to understand the relative profitability of bus services at an individual route level. So wh where an operator runs a particular service, how is that operated on a profitability level? You know, are the times of day that it is profitable, times of day that it is not? Where is it relative to their minimum threshold of it being rem remained and retained as a commercially sustainable service? So we've done some work historically on this, going back five or six years at least. Um, some further work to do. We've engaged with a third party to look at whether they can give us some support in terms of whether they can model some of the data that we already have to understand route level profitability for operators. So that, that work remains ongoing at the moment, Chair. Um, but uh, all of the data, as I say, in terms of the evidence relating to those actions is either in progress or with the auditors in terms of their audit record. So I'll, I'll pause there, Chair, but happy to take any questions. Uh, Chair, there's probably just one other point to note. In, in the actions, there was an action around level of risk associated with uh, concessions so in the actions log. What I'll suggest is instead of going back to that particular action, I'll update that in respect of the work that's been done on this particular um, internal audit because quite a lot of the activities relating to the bus data quality audit are also relevant to that particular action as well in terms of levels of risk and checks that we make on um, individual operators in terms of their concession reimbursement claims. So. Um, Again, happy to go into that in more detail if you wish, but otherwise we'll, we'll provide a written update into the actions log to, to provide um, what's in place. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm conscious it's not quite 12 o'clock and the sandwiches haven't been wheeled in yet, so shall we push on for another five or ten minutes, I think, and try and get through as much as we can do. Um, yeah. Can I just uh, thank you Thank you for that. Uh, my last meeting, oh, uh, you've, you've done an excellent job of chairing this, this, this committee, and uh, I've really enjoyed um, working alongside you. Right, okay. I think we've done up to items 10 and 12 and 13, but not item 11, PCC update. I understand Claire is on screen for us. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, right, can we um, throw it over to internal audit then and do their progress report, item 15? Thank, thank you, Chair. So we've got our progress report, um, which provides a summary on the internal audit work since the last um, audit in this committee. 
Um, so since then, we've finalised two reports. We've got the adult education budget framework and the assurance framework report, which are later on in the agenda. Um, and then we just have two internal audit reviews, which are um, nearing completion, and they're due to complete this week and next, which are the governance review and the um, internal audit follow-up work. Um, and we're confident that's going to be completed by the year end. Um, and then lastly, in their progress report, we have um, our annual service review, which is an update on the key performance indicators of the internal audit charter. Um, and you'll see that those are all kind of positive. Um, and we've discussed those with management and with committee before. That was all I was going to be able to pull out for the progress review, but I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee members? I've just got um, a, a couple just to, to, to note that the cyber and there's a series of high progress recommendations on that. So please keep on top of that because that's an area which is, is, is an, it's a national worry. Um, uh, there's a question around management res responses to reports, which is 16, and that's it. Yeah, so as mentioned, there is just that one report which then just make that KPI kind of out of range. Um, so I'm confident that next year um, we have really good engagement with, um, with management, so I'm confident next year that we can meet that, meet that KPI and keep it as 10 working days. Thank you. Okay, well, well now we're jumping around um, like a kangaroo, but can we now go back to item 11 PCC update, please? Claire Monaghan. Yep, thanks, Chair, um, and apologies if you were waiting for me then. I just needed to take a quick break, so um, I'm back. So thank you. Um, and members will remember that we had an update a couple of months ago um, about the work to transfer PCC functions to the mayor. Um, so in May, um, all police and crime commissioner functions will transfer to the mayor and all PCC assets, rights and liabilities will transfer to the combined authority. Staff working in the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner will become employees of the Combined Authority and the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner for South Yorkshire will be abolished. The transfer of functions, responsibilities and staffing will take place after the election of a new mayor. So the current mayor's term will be um, curtailed um, for two years and there will be a new election on the 2nd of May for a mayor um, who will also exercise PCC functions. Um, and to give legal, if legal effect to these changes, the Home Office and the Department of Levelling or Housing and Communities are taking through the relevant statutory um, instruments through Parliament. Um, the transfer orders have now passed in the House of Commons and they passed in the Lodge yesterday. And we understand um, that ministers are going to sign um, the transfer order into law today. So um, to make sure that the transfer um, is completed smoothly, um, a programme board has been established um, overseeing all the transfer of functions between the OPCC to the Combined Authority. And the Combined Authority as the receiving organisation has got overall responsibility for the programme. But of course, we're working hand in glove with both the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office and with South Yorkshire Police to make sure that the transfer is um, undertaken in the smoothest and most effective way possible. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do that without that support from the PCC's office and the police. So we're really grateful for the work that they've been doing. Um, I co-chair that programme board alongside the Chief Executive of the PCC's office. Um, and also um, that board is populated by members of staff from the Command Authority, um, the OPCC and South Yorkshire Police. Um, underneath the board, we've got four programme um, working groups now. Uh, one focused around effective working, that's looking at finance, legal governance and risk management and procurement. Um, that will be looking at what the constitution needs to look like post-transfer, um, making sure that we've got all the decision-making processes in place and financial arrangements um, nailed before the point of transfer, because of course it's of critical importance that particularly um, the decisions that South Yorkshire Police require can be taken in an orderly undertaken in an orderly way. Procurement and contracting, things like that, will remain with South Yorkshire Police. So there's no um, disruption of service um, to, to, to the things that the police um, procure themselves directly. Um, there's also a location and equipment group, um, and that's looking at our estates, fleet, IT, information governance, making sure that the sensitive information that the um, OPCC and the police handle um, is handled appropriately post-transfer, um, making sure that we've got all the right accommodation in place for staff. 
there's a HR group um, and that is, um, as you would imagine, focusing on the chief transfer of the staff, um, which is a really significant piece of work um, that I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. And then fourthly, there's a stronger together working group. And I think really importantly, this brings together um, staff from both organisations to say what are the benefits going to be of us working together um, in the new arrangements, what are the additional benefits and the value add that can be delivered to the communities across South Yorkshire by bringing PCC functions into the combined authority. So the staff transfer um, is, is obviously of critical importance. Um, so we are undertaking um, extensive consultation through the GP transfer of staff. We've already held two group consultation events um, with staff. The first took place in February. There was a second one at the beginning of March and a third is due to take place in April. So through those sessions, staff have been presented um, with our proposals um, for the transfer. The consultation process was explained to them um, and we talked about how functions would align some functions that currently sit in the PCC's office in standalone functions. So a standalone comms function, standalone um, finance function will be incorporated with the corporate functions in Simca. And then there will also be a um, separate policing and crime um, directorate um, that, that takes on the, the core of that work. Um, in the second session, um, and the unions have been involved in these sessions, it's been really helpful. Um, we went through the feedback and a couple of changes that we've made on the um, back of the first session. Um, and we're also running individual staff consultations with the members of staff affected with HR and again with trade union colleagues. Um, and as I say, the third um, group staff consultation is due in the middle of April when we will be feeding back to staff um, on the outcomes of that consultation process before they finally transfer across to the combined authority on the 7th of May. And I just wanted to touch briefly on the audit arrangements post transfer. So the police and crime commissioner, so the mayor in the future model um, with PCC functions and the chief constable are required to establish an independent audit committee. And it's recommended practice that this be a combined body, um, which looks at both the internal and external audit reports for the PCC function and also for the chief constable. And there is, as it stands today, a joint committee established um, that, that undertakes that function. Um, guidance is that that audit committee should comprise of between three and five members, um, and they must all be independent of both the police and crime commissioner or in, in our future arrangements, the mayor um, and the police force. Um, and we are working on proposals of what um, the arrangements between this committee and that joint audit committee um, will be post election and we will include members in those conversations over the coming weeks. Um, so it's just a quick whistle stop to let you know where we are up to with the work and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much Claire. Are there any questions on that? No, I think that. I think we're clear on that. Thank, thank, thank you, Claire. Welcome. Thanks very much. Right. What I'm proposing to do now is to try and catch up to, the, to do the remaining internal audit items, just in case there are any members of the public who are watching and are expecting to see those be, be, before now, and they don't don't have to go and miss them because they're going out and doing the shopping in the afternoon. So, if we can do item 16, internal audit reports, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so we have our two um, internal audit reports, the first being the adult education budget framework. So this review looked at the strategy, the due diligence, whether roles and responsibilities were clear and defined and the controls in place to kind of monitor, um, manage and monitor the performance and data validation and the payments. Um, overall, it came out with reasonable um, assurance and we found that there were processes in place there to support um, the control framework and we could see that um, there'd been changes made which has strengthened the process since the last um, internal audit. Um, we identified two medium and one low um, priority actions which were discussed with management. The two low, one was in regards to due diligence. We did sample testing five um, grant and five independent training providers and of the five grant in one instance we found the due diligence hadn't been completed there and the actual due diligence tracker which is used currently um, it didn't capture um, easy to identify um, documentation in terms of what had been received and reviewed. But probably what's worth noting for the committee is that the team um, has been set up since November 2023 um, and they've changed the processes going forward to make sure that this due diligence process was going to be captured during the tender process. Um, so we, what we identified was kind of the old process and going forward there's a new process um, going to be in place. Um, and then the second medium was in regards to contracts. 
Um, so again, we identified one instance where the contract hadn't been signed. Um, we did have sight of the chasing, but again, that one contract hadn't been signed. Um, it is an annual contract, so that provider had signed previous years. Um, it's just this year's they hadn't had that signed. Um, and that was all I was going to pull out really on that report, and I'm happy to take questions um, on that. Are there any questions from any members on that report? Yeah, in terms of the, um, I think the weaknesses that we're exposed to by not having contract for documentation, mm -hmm. um, what's, what was the sort of uh, value, roughly, that the authority was exposed to? Just sort of in the orders of millions. I mean, it's quite a large budget. So the total grant allocations, it was 31 million for the year. I've not got the actual number for that contract individually, but I can find out and bring that back. Oh, okay, that'll be helpful, thank you. Um, and do you think that the staff involved understand the importance of getting contract documentation right? Because I'd be interested in terms of what exposure the authority had or what, it, what remedies it had lost by the fact that it didn't have contractual documentation there. I don't know if we could establish that in the long got signed contract there was in fact a contract in place and we could therefore enforce our legal rights. So the um, team that obviously we spoke to, they've had some key changes made and I think that they've come in fresh pair of eyes and they've looked at the processes and they're um, changing some of them to kind of strengthen them, especially in the regards to the contract and the due diligence, getting some of these um, controls implemented right at the beginning. In regards to the contract and the due diligence, I think we do understand, you know, the risk there that not having that due diligence means, you know, if it's a new provider, how do you know that they're you know, financially stable, can provide that um, good quality um, provision to the learners. Um, and the, the chasing was all there. So I think we do, we do understand um, the value of it and there is that chasing um, in place. And if I remember the report, the detail properly, um, there were a number of um, contract documentation that was missing. It wasn't always one provider, it was with a number of it was just one, no, it was just one provider. It's just always one it was provider. Just, no, so the due diligence was missing with, from one provider, yeah. and the contract that hadn't been signed with one provider. We looked at 10, I think for, for memory, I want to say 29, but I wouldn't hold yeah. me to that. Um, it was 29 overall, we looked at 10, and then of the 10, of the 10 9, we did see that there was in place, the contract was signed with just the one. Uh, but it was a failing with the same provider. No, it was different. Different providers. Different That's providers right. between the two actions. Okay. Gareth's coming in, coming in with some more information. Yeah, I think uh, there's a, a couple of perhaps useful contextual points. Um, we, we, we only provide grants to local authority or college partners, so they, are, they tend to be the most stable financial institutions, and that was where the due diligence was missing. We definitely did do the due diligence on the procured private providers. That's a really fundamental point for us. The um, point about the contract documentation not being signed, and relative risk. Um, we've, we've always been very clear that there's also a risk about people not getting the training at the right times in all this. Um, so the, the contract documentation wasn't signed by a, a procure provider. We, I guess we have two options at that point. We recognize that we have a constructive obligation because we've verbally agreed to the services to be delivered. We've had MCA board approval to award to those providers. We've signed contracts. If they don't sign them, there's largely two options, I think. It is we tell them not to deliver the training, at which point we're disadvantaging people in the real world, um, or we, we, al we allow it to continue at risk and chase them down hard to get the <coughs> documentation signed so that we, uh, we've got everything in the right place. And it, of course, having signed documentation is, is really important. But I think in this instance, what we were trying to balance was that risk that people start to miss out on real world life opportunities because not getting the training, whilst we recognize that in a court of law we would have a constructive obligation and we probably would be held to the contract. Um, so that that's the thing that we're all, always balancing in this sense. Um, I, I think 
the, the totality of where we're up to, though, does reckon, um, represent a, quite an improvement. So we've, um, when we got the first AEB audit done, I think the year before last, there were some holes in what we were doing and we recognised the need to tighten everything up. We've, um, we've set up an entirely new team, moved the team from under um, my, my directorate to sit exactly with the AEB team and I think that has really paid dividend um, and that we are s starting to see some improvement. So we definitely recognise that there's there's room for improvement on this, but it, it kind of feels more snagging less at this point of stuff that we need to get right. Um, so I guess from my my part is, is to say thank you for internal audit for doing another good report, but also thank you to the team who have, have really moved us on a long way. And we've still got bits to, to get right, but I think we've, we've vastly improved on where we were. Thank you, Gareth. Are there any further questions from members on that report? Sorry, just just one. Um, I mean, maybe Gareth, you can answer this one because uh, I don't think it might have been within the audit scope. But do we have t taking your point about improving things for people in the real world? Do we have any measures for this budget KPIs that show what impact it's had? Gareth. Yes, um, so there, there are outputs that we, we are required to meet um, and we undertake monitoring and evaluation on the results of, um, of the program performance. So if it'd be helpful, we, we could ask someone from the team to come back to the committee at a future point. Uh, from my point of view, that, that would be interesting to see how we measure what that's uh, been effective. Yes, thank you. Okay, th thank you for that report. And if you could circulate the value of it to, to members as, as requested. Uh, your, your second report, please. Thank you, Chair. So the next report was the um, Ashar Lynch Framework Review. So this review focused um, primarily on the key changes made to the 23-24 um, framework, those reduced touch points, that more streamlined decision-making process. Um, and we also looked at kind of how um, lessons learned were considered and, you know, that um, improvement process and the workshops held. Um, as you'll see, it came out with substantial assurance um, and there was just too low um, actions agreed with management where um, we identified kind of that improvement point. One was in relation to making sure that the um, framework um, reflected the new governance model, and you can see later on in the agenda that that's already been actioned. Um, and then the second was in relation to training logs, just to make sure that um, you've got a record of staff who are involved in that, um, the assurance framework, that they've got that training um, has been undertaken. But um, a very positive report. I have to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions on that? Gareth? Yeah, could I just make a really a quick point that I'm, I'm really proud of this report and the contributions that the team have put into getting it into this place. So we, we made a, a lot of fundamental system-wide changes to the insurance framework in the last year, and the team have done an excellent job in rolling it out. We're starting to see a real impact in the, the, the pace at which we are bringing schemes through our processes now. Um, whilst maintaining the rigour of assessment. So um, thank you very much to everyone involved and thank you to Audit for the report. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good to see we've, we've moved a long way in that because that's been a, an issue for a long time. So thanks to officers and from my perspective, thanks to the reports which I found clear. Thank you very much. So on, on to your plan. Thank you, Chair. So I'll talk you briefly through this plan. Um, so as you remember around this time last year, we brought uh, our plan for the year and the audits that we're going to cover. So this is an annual process that we go through where we'll meet initially uh, with our key sponsors, so Gareth, Mike and, and Claire, but then also we, we went into the ELB meeting as well, um, where we also discussed the potential areas for inclusion. Um, and of course, we assessed the risk register, looked through there and, and discussed that in depth to say, are we covering the right areas and have we got the coverage that we need to give the assurances, hopefully, that this committee are, are seeking. So we undertook that uh, a number of weeks ago now, or probably over a month or so ago now, and provided this plan. So I don't plan on going through every audit in there, but just to pick out a couple of sort of key ones that you can see, we've linked to the strategic risks on the first view. Um, and you know most of the areas that you'll see in here have actually come up already today with the areas of such as the tram governance, looking at it from the MCA perspective, health and safety. Um, cyber, of course, is always an area uh, uh, you know, of concern anywhere because of the nature and the changing landscape there. Um, bus tender mm -hmm. services, PCC integration. So hopefully you can see from that that you know, this is linking to the key projects, key risks that are under, uh, undergoing at the moment and will continue over the coming year. 
Um, and also just a quick point to note, uh, and again, it was brought up earlier with the tram update, that there's a free audits in there for tram company themselves. And, and as that was outlined in the presentation earlier, um, the scope of our, uh, of our internal audit plan has been expanded to include areas um, for tram and, and they're the key areas that provide our opinion in terms of internal control, risk and, and governance. Um, but other than that, um, I'll take any questions on the plan as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Aaron, just on, um, I think it's page 77, the plan for the audit tram. I think we've got down there that we're going to look at accounts receivable for that. Is that intended to be revenue more generally? Because I'm guessing most of what the tram's revenue will be will be cash or card. Um, and looking at things like accounting for season tickets, if they're still a big item uh, post pandemic. Uh, and just revenue protection in, in general for, to make sure that we're getting the money in from the tram services. Well, whatever you're going to say, you may come into. <laughs> yeah, I can come in if, it, if it's helpful. Uh, yeah, Paul's, Paul's assessment of the um, of accounts receivable is, is correct. Uh, broadly speaking, the majority of CIFDL uh, new tram companies' income will be from on board as well as off board ticket <coughs> sales. Yeah. Um, so there will, there will certainly be merit in, in testing whether, for example, the, the retail fittings we were discussing earlier, that they're working effectively. So indirectly, there'll be an element of bank and cash testing uh, happening as part of this. I, in terms of your, your, your bog standard trade debtors, there's very little um, that we're expecting in year one. Um, it'll just be a, a few accounts um, for advertising possibly, uh, and so that'll be fairly minimal. So I think on materiality grounds, yes, Paul, he'll mainly focus towards the ticket sales. Okay, thank you. I, I, I've got a um, couple of questions or, or comments. Um, one, good to see we're getting continuity of the, of the, of the audit team, which is, which is helpful, thanks. And I'll, I'll, while the external audit is here, I'll, I'll, I'll look at them and hope that we can manage to do that on the external audit side over the next few years. I know it's always tough because people do move on, but that, that's good. Um, second one, just to, to check, we've had a, an increase in audit days because we've got the tram company coming in, and I think that's to be expected. There is an awful lot going on now. I mean, are you happy that you have enough resource um, to cover things? And, and, and linked to that, I think you've you've covered off pretty much all the core risks I could see on the on the risk register over the next year or so. And there's nothing on IZ readiness in, in, in that, which was about the one I, I saw. You've, you, you're testing change programs by testing individual programs, which is the other one. But um, core 24, I, I couldn't I couldn't see it in. Um, so are you, are you happy you've got enough enough days and you're able to, to cover everything off? Yeah, no, uh, definitely in the. Uh, you know, the days, as you say, are in line with last year in terms of the core plan um, with the addition of tram as, as we expected. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, we're satisfied we've got a good coverage across the risks and also, you know, from a head of internal audit opinion perspective, there's enough coverage there to provide that overall assurance. Um, and in terms of the coverage of the risks, um, that was something we, we literally went line by line through the risk register as part of our planning to see, is there something we can add value here too? Is there an audit that particularly needed, is it ready right now? But of course we review this, review it annually as part of this process, but also you know, as part of the year as it goes, we meet regularly with, with management as well. And actually, you know, any time if anything becomes more of a priority or actually there's additional assurance required, we can flex the plan and you know, obviously any changes we would bring via this committee, but there is that option. But um, you know, like I said, we did cover each of the risks in depth at the time and you know, the ones that came out are from this report. Thank you. I'm, I'm just conscious officers are dealing with a huge range of things at the moment and, and one of the tools we can get to get some assurance over them is internal audit if we need. But if you're confident you're covering off everything, that's great. Any further questions? No. Right. At this point then, 20 minutes late, I'll, I'll call, the, call the first session to a close. Can we still start again at 1 o'clock so that, again, any members of the public who are coming in can, can see us and we'll try and whiz through this afternoon's session? Thank you.
Right, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the second part of the uh, Audit and Risk Committee for South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority. Uh, a couple of points to, to note at the start. The, the first is that since Councillor Loft left us, we're, we're not actually quorate now. Audit committees are generally sort of scrutinising bodies rather than decision-making bodies, so I don't think that generally affects uh, many of the reports we're taking, but we will go through a procedure to make sure that Council of Office has also approved the internal audit plan. I know he's seen it and had the opportunity to ask questions on it in the private meeting with the, with the internal auditors before this meeting, so I'm fairly confident he doesn't have any extra queries, but we'll just go through, go through that loop. But that's just a note on the, on, the, on the rest of the agenda. And the second to say more, more formally that we, we neglected to realise that Councillor Auckland is leaving the, the committee after and retiring as a councillor after 25 years as a councillor and many years on this committee and its predecessors at the, the, the ITA and things and also I know on a lot of pensions committees. Um, he'll, he'll be much missed and I'd, I'd like to say thanks to, thanks to him for all his, his hard work over the, over the last few years. Thank you. It's, <coughs> and Chair, it's been a pleasure working on this committee. I've really enjoyed my time here. And in the predecessors, I, I, I'll ask the same for the invite. If I can ask for a freebie, I'd like to get on the first franchise bus service. <laughs> I have to get about five o'clock to do it. I don't mind. <laughs> Perhaps the mayor can note it down anyway. I declare an interest. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you, Councillor Auckland, for all your hard work. Right, we'll now go back to the agenda and we'll, we'll go item 18, Assurance Framework. Lindsay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Assurance Framework is a document which explains how the organisation is structured, how we make uh, funding decisions and the process by which we appraise uh, business cases for investment. It's a document that we have to review and update every year. Um, it's submitted to government, it's submitted to three different government departments for sign-off, and it triggers the release of the gain share funding. This year's um, annual review of assurance was conducted between uh, November and December last year, and it identified a number of further improvements that we could make to the assurance process and also to the assurance framework itself. The changes that have been made are detailed in sections 2.1, but you'll see from the draft assurance framework that is attached to Appendix A that it refers to um, the new police and crime uh, powers from May 2024. The changes that have been made to the MCA board structure in terms of the replacement of the left and thematic boards uh, with the new business advisory board, Mayor's Economic Advisory Council and the eight cabinets or the portfolio groups. Uh, there's also a new statutory requirement on us to consult Active Travel England on schemes uh, which have elements of cycling, walking or wheeling. And there's also some uh, updates to the appraisal and approval process just to refine um, the efficiency of the um, appraisal system that we use. So um, with that considered, it was submitted to the MCA board on the 12th of March for their endorsement, which they did give and it's an opportunity now for members of this committee to make any final changes before we then submit the draft document to government for their approval. Thank you. Th th thank you, Lindsay. Uh, any questions from members? Uh, thank you for the report, Lindsay. Um, I'm interested on, I think it's page 96, where you talk about wiring money between different projects. When, when that's happening, how do we make sure that the outcomes and outputs of, say, Project A, if money's been moved over to Project B, because that's got a shortfall in funding, how do we make sure that we still get the outputs and outcomes from Project A that we were expecting? Okay, so what normally happens is that when there is any change or any environment, um, whether it's between a project to a different project, what we're always looking to do is to just to check whether or not the benefit cost ratio of that scheme is still applicable. So we will look to see how those changes actually impact on the benefit cost ratio so that we can just make sure that it's still representing value for money. But any of those changes are presented to the programme board here. So it's got oversight by finance, by um, the funding monitoring and reporting team, as well as assurance as well. So we cover it off that way. So we can see what the impact is on any, any changes to the project, whether it's environment of funding, 
um, and whether or not it's reduced output. Invariably, it's not normally reduced um, outputs or outcomes. <coughs> it's just in terms of cost increases normally. But it, go, it goes through that process. It's more the opportunity to do it rather than um, restrict them and have to s submit fundamental change control requests through to the MCA board. It, we're just dealing with things internally, which in a sort of high inflation environment is, it means we're much more agile about being able to respond. Yeah, and I think you brought out well in the report the uh, improvements that there's been in uh, speed of approvals and changes, which is uh, to be commended. Th thank you for that. I've, I've just got one question. I, I couldn't see much on the incorporation of police and their powers. There's a, there's a mention in paragraph 2.26. Mm -hmm. um, are we intending to expand that or are we just going to cross-refer to something in police in due course? Yes, so obviously at the moment the order is making its way through Parliament. Um, so depending on the outcome of that, um, we can refer any changes, but there will be an awful lot more detail in the 2025 assurance framework following that transfer of powers because it will be happening mid-financial year. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? No, in which case, thank you very much for that report. Thank Minister. you. Right, the, ne the next item is Treasury Management Strategy. Gareth, and I'm guessing Simon about. Yeah, I'll just kick us off and then bring Simon in. So, um, committee will be familiar with the fact that each year we produce a Treasury Management Strategy. That sits alongside our revenue budget and capital program activity and our reserve strategies. The TMS covers the management of our cash flows, our loan and investment portfolios, and also our banking arrangements. So over the last decade or so, um, we've adopted a fairly conservative approach to the, the management of our, our treasury activity. Uh, we've been winding down our debt portfolio. That's mostly legacy investments associated with the super tram system, paying debt as it's fallen due, um, managing our cash um, um, that we um, largely received from reserves um, and also grant received in advance. The management of our treasury activity has become more prominent over the last couple of years and that's largely due to the increase in interest rates that has meant that we've been um, accruing significant returns on our cash deposits and that's allowed us to do a lot of exciting activity. So a lot of the money that we have used to get ready for our bus franchising, build up financial resilience through reserves has come through our treasury and management investment income returns. We've been able to set up a uh, capacity and capability reserve internally that support an extra investment into people and resources that's come from this activity. We're running projects such as the uh, Beds for Babies, Safe Place to Sleep project, which is again us investing in things we're own funded for. So the benefits of the TMS are really starting to play out in the um, overall management of our activity. Um, and we've, we're in a really quite good space on this. So the TMS picks up um, about what we're going to do in the new year, at which point I'll pass over to Simon. Thanks, Gareth. Um, well, just to put a little more detail into the sort of overarching messages that Gareth provided, um, we, we've been paying down debt, uh, as Gareth said, which is mainly legacy debt from the, uh, the days, going back to the days when Supertram was constructed. So in 23-24, um, we've repaid 50 million of PW, PWLB debt, and we've also repaid in 20 million of market loans. So that's flowing through into 24-25 and generating some significant interest sa savings of about 1.6 million in 24-25, just by way of illustration. And that will continue over the next three or four years as the, as the debt steps down and it gets repaid. So um, the, um, the, the plans, the capital expenditure plans for the next three years, um, they're all fully funded. So there's going to be no new additional borrowing requirements over the next three years. <coughs> so we, we haven't got any intentions to take out any fresh borrowing in the medium term. Um, so that um, we, we, we don't anticipate taking out any new borrowing. The, the, the overall position now is that because we've repaid £70 million worth of debt in 23-24, the authority is now in an under-borrowed position, and that means that 
the underlying need to borrow exceeds the actual borrowing that we've now got, external borrowing. So we've got an underborrow provision of around about £60 million in the current year and for the next three years or so. Um, but that's not going to trigger the need for us to take out external borrowing because we've got um, still a very high level of reserves and balances and unapplied capital grants. So that effectively is going to cover us off for at least the next three years or so, uh, which means that we don't have to go out and borrow externally. And it still gives us, over and above that, some um, surplus cash that we're going to be able to invest in generating a, a return on. So we're still going to gain some treasury investment as income. Um, so uh, just in terms of one thing probably to draw to your attention, that we have to negotiate a debt cap annually. And the debt cap for 24-25 that's been negotiated is um, makes allowance for the fact of the impending integration with the OPCC. So we've factored in an additional 139 million, which was our guesstimate at the time of negotiations as to what we thought the police's um, underlying borrowing requirement was going to be. They've subsequently issued their treasury management strategy for 24-25, and their borrowing requirement is 128 million. So we're actually we've slightly over-egged it. So we've got some cover as far as that's concerned for 24-25. Um, should integration go ahead. Um, on the investment strategy, as Gareth said, we've been well, fairly conservative in terms of the types of counterparties that we've invested with. However, having said that, <coughs> because the interest rates have increased, we've actually generated, we're generating a, you know, a good rate of return on, a, on our treasury investments. So in 23-24, uh, currently, it's, it's over 4% that we're generating. Um, and we're expecting that to tail off a little in 24-25 as interest rates fall back from the, the peak of 5.25% currently. But nevertheless, it's still going to provide you know, a, a substantial return in 24-25. Um, and then I just, just briefly, just to touch on a final couple of, of things which are new for this year's Treasury Management Strategy. It's not been included previously. Um, one is that we are now in a position where we can take advantage of capital flexibilities. So the capital flexibilities, um, we're allowed to use proceeds from the disposal of assets, should we choose to do so, towards meeting revenue costs from making efficiency savings or restructuring the organisation. So we anticipate we, might, we may have 1.9 million um, of, of, of proceeds from the disposal of assets. That's in Gareth's armoury should he cho choose to use it and it makes sense to do so um, to be able to use those capital receipts in order to bring those efficient the, the revenue costs associated with those efficiency savings and restructure and integration that's taking place um, and the final thing just to note is that with I can't, I'm not sure the clock's ticking one day so many hours so many minutes left before the tram comes back into the MKA ownership um, <coughs> that um, in order to underpin the new tram company that's <coughs> taking over the tram operations, the MCA is going to be giving a financial guarantee in favour of that company because it's going to be operating at a loss, at least initially for the first few years. So um, that is a quick counter through. In terms of the, the recommendations, the recommendations are just we're looking for a audit committee to endorse the strategy um, and the indicators which provide the operating framework that we're going to be working within in 24-25. And just also to note there's a couple of additional items in terms of potential use of capital flexibilities and the you know, financial guarantee they're going to be providing to the tram company. So um, that's, that's it as far as I want to say. So I'll open it up to any questions anybody may have. Thank you. Do you want to do, do your microphones? Um, I've got one or two, but I'll, I'll defer to the, to the committee. But you've mentioned the financial guarantee a couple of times there. Obvious question is how much is it? If we kick off on the other one. Um, well, I d the figure that we're going to need to underwrite is the, I mean, it's built into the, the subsidy. The transport budget for 24 25, there is a subsidy of £7 million. So the 
that is a that is which will should hopefully be sufficient to, to underwrite the company in 24-25. In terms of the financial guarantee, I'm not sure that we've got a figure as yet. I, d I don't think there's a, a, a number placed on the guarantee. It's just you know a guarantee of the the, the overall liabilities of the company. That sounds a bit open ended. Um, is my worry. Uh, you know, you normally say with a fraction. Of, I know if it, are we just saying whatever loss they make, we're we're underwriting it from naught to hundred million. It, well, essentially, that um, the MCA approves the business plan for the authority uh, for the company each year. So we are we are essentially fixing that um, exposure. So has anybody asked for a guarantee when we've been novating the contracts as part of the uh, transfer? Has anybody come along and said, "What is this company and I'd like a guarantee for X amount"? Has there not come <coughs> that? That, that, that spe specific point hasn't come up. Um, however, a couple of alternative strategies um, from suppliers have, have, have um, come along. So, for example, asking for um, you know, in insurance cover trade references um, or even for us to sign a, a direct debit mandate. But these are customary in, in the rail sector and with these particular suppliers. So no nothing... Nothing uh, to the extent that you've described, Paul, no. So nobody's asked for a parent company guarantee? No, not to my knowledge as yet, no. But should we, should we need to do so, well, obviously we, we want to support uh, the subsidiary company as best we could. But no, no one specifically asked for that as far as I know. And who's got the delegated authority to do that if somebody does come along? What, what's our process for giving that? Because it perhaps comes back to Dave's point about how much are we committing ourselves to? So the, 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 the MCA each year agrees the business plan. Business plan um, sets out the subsidy requirement from the MCA to the company. Should that subsidy requirement be required to be revisited, that would be recourse back to the MCA because effectively it's a, it's a new budget requirement. So we'd be required to submit supplementary estimates on the, the budget as usual. Um, the directors of the company would, if there was a requirement for a PCG, the directors of the company, of which I am one, would be required to seek that from the MCA. And if they pay the financial regs, that um, the distribution of guarantees is uh, a matter for myself and the head of paid service. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's just a degree of nervousness because we've seen w with you know the other bodies in Sheffield where the city council has been underwriting their financial position that it's 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 you know caused a lot of grief over the years. Hence the the nervousness about a fairly open-ended sounding guarantee here. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a reality that as the the, um, the the sole shareholder in the company that the, the the financial performance of the company washes straight back onto the MCA. The, the manner in which that is controlled is via the agreement of the annual subsidy levels, at which point the, the, the board can say yes or no. If, the, if there was a requirement of subsidy over and above that require, um, guaranteed in the business plan and the board decided that they didn't wish to support that, then obviously the company directors would have to take remedial action to reduce the... the um, financial requirement from the MCA. So the I guess the, the control that I think you're looking for is is by the agreement of the annual subsidy that comes from the annual business plan um, with the quarterly touch points on performance back to the board that we're, we're um, guaranteeing to take. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions on the TM strategy? Paul. Thank you. Um, I liked what you were saying, I think it's page 178, about showing the impact, or bringing in the borrowing indicators in the uh, authorities, it looks good. So is it your intention then, this is section B, um, is it your intention then that when we do reports and we talk about the financial implications, if there's a significant impact on any of the indicators that you've um, suggested that are used that will include that in the financial implications of the report? Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, as part of the routine 
quarterly monitoring that we do and the quarterly revenue capital position to the MTA board. Um, we append uh, 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 the treasury manage an update on the treasury management position as well. So if there was any, if there was any um, risk of any breach of any of these indicators, or if they needed to be reconsidered, that would be done through that sort of quarterly reporting process that we take to the MTA board. Fine, un un understood. And if I say came along with a plan to I don't know what to borrow five hundred million, let's say for a scheme we're going to do. That would obviously have an impact on those indicators. In that report, we'd be saying, and it's going to move it by this amount. Yeah, that's the, the intention. So um, the, these indicators represent what we can see coming down the track and how we intend to manage it um, as part of our capital strategy. If an opportunity arose um, that meant that the MCA was required to borrow a lot of money to finance an upfront investment and um, let's just imagine we repay that through gain share. That would probably be out with this strategy, at which point we'd need to, to adjust it to, to re-accommodate that decision. And then one other point of clarification at the bottom of page 80 on indicator 5, ratio of financing costs to net revenue stream, which looks pretty healthy there, that, you, you know, only... 10% of our finance costs are taken up by our revenue stream. My only question would be, is that really the net revenue? Because presumably some of that transport levy is required to fund operations and maybe some of the unrestricted income isn't pure contribution. Th this table is always slightly awkward for us to prepare. Um, because I think it, in when I was doing this in Sheffield, we always used council tax as the the, the revenue stream to, to uh, monitor this against. We don't have a sort of comparator in that respect. So we've, we've chosen um, to always use the transport levy as the core income stream for transport. And I think if you played in gain share as revenue as well, Simon, into this. Uh, yeah, so, so also the treasury investment income, so it's not ring fence for any specific purpose like revenue grants, etc. So it's generally available for any purpose that the MCA sees fit. So I think where I'd be coming from is to say, rather than calling it the net revenue stream, why don't we just call it the gross revenue? Because I get totally that the money you're making, or the money the authority's making on its investment is very clearly cash that's available and it's a policy choice as to where the authority uses it so if we say we're making 10 million which we are next year and we're intending to make 10 million next year that's there to cover the 8 million of financing costs from that from that point of view we'll just keep it simple like that um, it's just that when you look at the, the transport levy I don't think all that 55 million is there to cover the financing costs no, um, but I guess in a similar way that not all of the council tax requirement is available to fund all uh, local authorities' capital financing costs. So it, it, I, I think I see what you're saying. It becomes a bit circuitous. Um, transport levy is set each year knowing that we have a capital finance requirement, just I guess in the same way council tax is set each year knowing that local authorities' cap finance requirement. I think the, the indicator in itself is is sensible in what he's trying to achieve, which is looking at gearing ratios. It's just it doesn't necessarily reflect the way in which local bodies fund themselves. So. Yeah, I think it's probably where I'm coming from, is that what I've seen is that sort of commercial companies would tend to come, would look at interest to net profit, say, but what you don't really have in local authorities, as you say, Gareth, is a net profit figure to roll back against. But the key thing is overall, it's net revenue. And it's reducing, which is... <laughs> That's even better. Thank you. Um, my observation is all of this will come back on the MCA if it doesn't work out. That's a reality, as indeed it was with all our clever wheezes to move Sheffield City Council assets onto the community. It, it can't be made to work. It comes back. And, uh, so 
I think we stand as an effective guarantee in reality. I'm sitting here thinking, would I give a guarantee if I was asked for? Or? Well, yeah, probably. I probably think you know, letter comfort or some something, but not. Why should we? Why should? Uh, I think I'd resist a request for a guarantee. Why should we give one? But there we go. Uh, uh, so I, I guess the. Uh, the reason we require a guarantee is that the the new tram company has absolutely no yeah. trading history, yeah. so no one would ever give it the benefit of credit in a transaction, yeah. and we require upfront payment consistently, and so on. So, someone needs to stand behind it at least yeah. to say we're we're good for this, um, and that's that's the role of the parent in this relationship, which is is the MCA. So we're standing behind it in general, but we haven't got somebody who supplies rail saying, I want a separate guarantee, maybe. You know. Well, taking that specific point, because that's where the big money spend will be, yeah. and that's where suppliers will be concerned. Um, any purchase of rails isn't for CIFL to do. All, all kind of rails and et cetera, rolling stock, will be purchased by the MCA. All those assets belong to the MCA and right. sit on the MCA's balance sheet anyway. So, and we have. We've all, from past history, as you know, we've had at least two phases of re-railing already, so we've got the, uh, the established relationships with those suppliers. Yeah. So in that, in that sense, um, Council Auckland, that's not an issue. But uh, in principle, though, you're absolutely right, where there's no previous trading history, you could quite rightly expect a supplier to ask the question. But from what I've found out so far, no PCG requests have been made. However, to be doubly sure, whilst we're in committee, I will ask the procurement lead if he's had any and if so I'll play that back at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Well that answers the question I was going to ask about what assets has CIFL got on its balance sheet which if, if it doesn't own the rolling yeah. stock and it doesn't own the track and it presumably doesn't own the depot it's got very little. Kit and equipment um, it's larger. Which is why potentially a supplier would want the guarantee because if SIFTL did go in its view bust, it wouldn't get any, there's no assets that could be liquidated to fund any liabilities. But if we're buying the rail directly, say, we're buying it, so it's so. And the, the big sort of service contracts are things like utilities. Um, it's obviously an energy hungry yeah. company. Um, next biggest thing is probably staffing, but the, the intention is to keep most of the capital assets and capital investment off the company because that, that already resides on the Sinker balance sheet and obviously the funding for the capital investment sits with Sinker as well. So. Right, okay, thank you. Just um, two, two more for me, one, one incredibly obvious one. On page 84, we say MRP prior to 2008 charge on a flatline basis over 50 years. That must mean it's 2% per annum, I assume. Um, and the other one is just noted that we, uh, we're we providing headroom of 348 million to accelerate capital investment from South Yorkshire Renewal Fund, which will come back to us if if, if we need to. So just a, a quick comment on, on a nod, nod on the first one and a quick comment on the second. <coughs> yeah, nod. Um, and then uh, the, the, the headroom is, it, it's not, so that headroom, it, as Simon has said, we, ha we have no borrowing plans right now. Um, but the function of having to go back to HMT on an annual basis to, to agree the, um, the, the overall um, borrowing um, limit means that it's, it's kind of incumbent on us to build in headroom if it's so required. So we, we, we do tend to max out the ask from HMT on the off chance that an opportunity does arise, but um, we've, we've got really quite prudent levels of headroom. I'd be very surprised if we get anywhere near that. Thank you. So, sorry. Sorry, can you go on, Paul? Raise one, it's, it's a minor point. Bottom of page 175, I think it's the third bullet point. I think that should be audit standards from this committee. It's not scrutinized. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Right. We'll move on to the next item. Oh, we, now we need to, we need to endorse this. We do. We do, don't we? So, yeah. So we'll we'll, in, we'll endorse that then. Right. Um, item 19 is a verbal transport risk working group. Thank you. 
very much. Um, <clears throat> the working group on Monday discussed the tram project in a great amount of detail, uh, and I think we've already covered that already on the uh, agenda today. Um, there's a couple of points I'd like to draw to members of the committee. Um, there's been some new risks identified, um, including one relating to the customer relationship management system, which is an old system, like many of the other systems in the authority, uh, which Microsoft will not be supporting the software on which it runs from January 2026. We need to procure a new one. Um, probably one of the key functions which this current CRM system supports is the issue of uh, concessionary passes. Uh, so we've got um, 18 months or so to, to go ahead and do it, which <coughs> sounds a long time, but probably in systems development terms it isn't. Um, but uh, the directorate's on with it, they've got a draft project plan, um, and the transport working group will monitor very closely um, how that's going. Uh, the second point that was raised <coughs> was the potential shortfall on a couple of projects. One's on the A61 and the other one's at Park Gate with uh, access improvements, park and ride. Um, those projects are expected to overspend and I think at the moment uh, there are no additional funds available to complete them, which will mean that work could potentially uh, be paused. Um, we've made representation central government to try to uh, gain additional funds, but that's something which we need to watch carefully. Uh, and final point from the transport working group would be my, on behalf of the members of the group, uh, thanks again to Council Orkham for his contributions and the support that uh, he's given uh, over the year I've been involved with it. And I'm extremely grateful and I wish you all the well, Council Orkham, for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report, Paul. Um, any questions from anyone else? I, I've just got one, which is probably for officers. If we don't get additional funds for those um, schemes, is there a plan B? Um, I'll answer. Uh, uh, probably treat each scheme slightly differently. For the A61 scheme, um, there might be some further opportunity for some, for some value engineering, but the cost or the time at which costs need to be incurred for that are put further in the future, so give us more time to try and um, negotiate and agree with that lead based planning process with DFT. For Parkgate, we're much further on, we're in, we're in large construction, and the reality is, is if uh, we're, we haven't got any alternative options with that, we would have to pause work and then once we agree that lead based planning process, we recommend that that's heard. So that's the current position. Um, I'm, I'm not party to the exact conversations in terms of the lead based planning of the capital progress. It's not an area I'm personally responsible for, but that'll certainly be a uh, reparational consequence on those two schemes as they stand today. Because downing tools on a scheme sounds like it's it's costly, and, and if contractors are listening into this and start getting worried that the scheme's going to pause at some point, they might start building in additional costs for us now. The um, the rebase re signing was agreed on Tuesday, um, so the good news in that respect. And program board received an update on the two programs, and um, we gave recommendations to the scheme promoters that it's likely not to to pound tools for all the good reasons that you just described. Um, and can we have a couple of solutions to some of this? But the um, the, there are so backstop options, which is you stop part of the scheme rather than it in its totality, so you can scale it if required. But um, yeah, we got good news earlier in the week from DFT. Okay, thank you. So it does sound like we've got some options to, to continue these. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. No further questions on that item. Right, I think we now go on to the um, Claire show with the next um, six items. So do you want to start off with 21 risk monitoring, please, Claire? Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the, the um, regular monitoring report that we bring to committee. Um, section 2.1 of the cover report highlights the activity since the last report in December. There's been lots of uh, risk management activity in this quarter, 
um, and a really good level of engagement from across the organisation in terms of updating and reviewing all the risks and uh, actions and controls. So the dashboard um, highlights some of the changes to the corporate risk profile and um, some of the risks that um, Paul's just mentioned and within directorates um, and included in the dashboard this time is the inclusion of um, risks with a, a cyber theme that are above an appetite level. Um, a rec the recent um, cyber internal audit recommended that we um, agreed an appetite level for um, risk with a cyber theme which we've, we've now done and we've included those and drawn them out in the dashboard and also amended the risk management framework which is on page 221 of the pack and specifically on page 238, um, which talks about appetite levels. Um, since the report's been finalised, we've made some further changes in the system to reflect the arrival of MEL, who we met earlier, Melanie, um, and reallocated some of the risks that have been previously um, assigned to PAT. Um, so happy to take any feedback on the content and format of the reports. We're looking to refresh that in this next quarter and um, refocus it and bring in some more comparative data um, and also to take any questions or field any questions to colleagues as appropriate. Thank you, Claire. Any, any questions from colleagues? Paul. If anybody's watching, we'll just pause the meeting while we try and overcome this technical problem or else you'll not be able to hear Paul's question. Thanks, Ellen, for that. Um, it's good that you talk about the engagements improving um, because I, I looked at the report and focused on the, the, the risks that we're saying are above our appetite and I managed to see maybe nine of them. I think I could divide in the top right hand corner where the, these are the um, high probability major impact type risks. Um, in terms of those being above our appetite, how do the owners <coughs> of those risks react? And what's the process we go by to try and get them back into a level that we're, we're comfortable with, please? That's, that's an interesting question, because this next quarter, again, in response to an internal audit recommendation, we're, we're introducing target scoring which should be aligned to appetite, so we understand that threshold. So that's kind of part of the next stage of development in, in this next period. Right, thank you, Claire. That's, that, that's helpful. So something to look forward to for the July report for that one. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Claire. Any, any other questions from, from members? I'll just note that we've got, you know, cyber is now flagging up as a really big risk. It was covered by IA last year. I think you're covering it again this year, aren't you, or following it up again this year? Yeah, I'm getting nods from IA colleagues, and it, it's one that uh, doesn't quite give me sleepless nights, but nearly does because it's, it's such a big worry at the moment. Okay, thank you. Next item then, please, Claire. Thank you. Um, so this is um, the annual kind of review and revision of the local code of corporate governance. Um, there have just been some minor amendments this, this time around, which have been uh, detailed at section 2.2. Um, happy to take any feedback from committee on any further amendments that might be needed. Thank you very much. Any comments or feedback from committee members? Paul. Mine would just to say thanks very much for doing the uh, report in a sort of track changes format so we can see what's been changed. It makes it an awful lot easier to follow uh, if, it's, if it's like that than having to compare the last one against the current one, so thank you for that. Uh, okay, thank you, and, and yes, th th thank you very much for this report, Claire. Uh, next item, you again. Thank you, so this is an update on the Governance Improvement Plan for 23-24. 
um, and it's really just to the committee to know that the, um, at this stage in the, the year we've still got four actions on the governance improvement plan that um, are outstanding or not complete, still in progress. Um, these largely relate to the harmonisation work that's happening between uh, the um, still ongoing from PTE and MTA integration. Um, and just a, a question to committee about w whether we should roll these actions into the 24-25 plan so we can continue monitoring those until completion. Okay, thank you. I mean, yes, I think obviously we should. And my question was going to be, you know, have we got a revised timetable for, for completing those? And if so, could we know what it is, please? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of items that we deferred. Um, so the reference in the um, appendix as items four um, and items ten. So the the this, well, the, the legislation that's um, now passed through uh, both houses to bring forward the the May 26 elections, May 2024 has just meant that we've got had to prioritise a lot of people's time down on delivering the OPCC integration at the same time as delivering the tram um, concession end programme and the tram OBC, um, which will be submitted this Thursday. It's kind of meant that we've not been able to meaningfully engage with the workforce on the proposed changes and rather than rush these through, um, we've um, took the decision it's carry on working on, on the new policies and uh, the, the new career framework, but um, defer the, the engagement with the staff until after the election in May. Um, so we're hopeful to get that concluded by quarter one uh, before people break up for the summer holidays. Thank you, thank you, Gareth. So end of Q1 to, to yeah. these, and yes, if you can continue reporting on them, please, that would that'd be great. Any questions from any other members? No? Right, okay, thank you for that. That's that's good and approved then. Next item, please, Claire. Thank you. So um, this next report um, just details the outcome of the annual governance review um, and um, highlights uh, some key areas that we think should be included in the 24-25 governance improvement plan. Um, so these are included for um, discussion and feedback from the committee. Um, following that, we'll um, circulate the draft um, AGS for feedback, and then that will go forward, including the Governance Improvement Plan, to the MCA AGM. So I'm trying to get lots of acronyms in there <laughs> uh, in June. Okay, thank you, Claire. Questions? Uh, Paul. Um, thank you. Do uh, directors sign off on the AGS? to say it's all, that they're following through everything that's there and they know any non-compliances? Yes, the AGS is signed off by the Head of Paid Service and the Chair of the Authority of Keeper now. Thank you. And, and Claire, we're saying it, it goes back periodically through to uh, ELB throughout the year for monitoring that. And just, just one thing, do we see that here then when it's when the uh, AGS has been completed with the non-compliances? This time around, just due to timing, um, we'll circulate it to committee members in between cycles because of the way the meetings fall, if that's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So, so under paragraph 2.2, .2, we've got the areas that we're concentrating on for, for in improvement then. And we're going to get more detail on those in due course, are we, with what we need to do in timescales and things. And, and that's going to come to us when, do we know? You can circulate that along with the annual uh, governance statement um, for further feedback. But yeah, we'll flesh those out and give some, um, make them time bound um, and give some um, ownership, some leadership on each of those points. Yeah. Great. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, if you, if you could do, please. Any further questions on this one? No. Next item, Claire again. Thank you. <laughs> Nearly done. Two to go. Um, uh, this is the draft um, annual report from the committee that will go forward to the um, the MCA AGM in June. Uh, so it's really to seek feedback from the committee on the contents of the report, um, particularly um, section six, which is um, a, a, an improvement plan for the committee itself. 
uh, based on the findings from the effectiveness survey that was completed recently. Just to take any feedback on the content. Okay, thank you, Claire. I mean, I'm, I've got a couple of bits of observations. There's a placeholder for the head of internal audit's opinion in it. I don't know if it's a question either for you or, or internal audit on whether we'll get that opinion in time. And then there's just a little bit up, up, updated for areas that you, you know that you need to do and you put yellow highlights in. Yeah, that, that, there's just some uh, little bits that need tidying up after this meeting so we can account for the statistics in terms of attendance and webcast views and just some other little bits and then obviously include the head of in, uh, internal audit opinion, which I think you'll be in line to do before the AGM. Yeah. So are, are we going to get the internal audit opinion in time for this then? Just check is the AGM on the 11th of June, is that right? Yeah, we should be able to get the same internal opinion yeah. then. <coughs> yeah. Th thank you. Uh, any other comments on this report, Paul? Thank you. Just the thought um, on the question of risk management and uh, the committee's capability and competency on this, is there anything our insurance brokers can do for us on this? Because before when I dealt with big corporate insurance brokers as part of the pitch for the business they always say we can give you training on various items one of which is sometimes risk management which obviously are the benefits but then they have got to get to the claim uh, and I wondered if ours were amenable to providing a day's training or half day's training a bit like we had with the treasury management uh, that, you, that you arranged kindly guys if we can get anything that way to help us with some practical tips for um, risk management, if they can give us any views on where we could improve ourselves as a committee. I think um, that would actually be really interesting, particularly in the context of um, the tram and being in its first year of operation. Um, and we, we are in inevitably attracting a premium on the, uh, the insurance price that we are paying as a new organization. Um, so I think, Claire, maybe uh, want to pick up with Steve, please. Thank you. I might wanted to come in there as well. Um, I could probably save Claire a job because I'm, I'm about to press send on an email to the broker. So I'll add that question <coughs> to it. Um, Gareth's quite right. We, we've been speaking to colleagues um, who, uh, in other MCAs, who operate tram systems, so, such as our colleagues up in um, Time and the Earth Nexus. And uh, one really sterling bit of advice that they, they gave us was to run a series of events when it's we're due to go through the annual renewal process where we invite prospective insurers um, to come and speak to the senior management at what will be SIFTL um, to talk them through all the improvements that we're putting through as parts of the first year delivery plan and Nexus have said that's, that's paid dividends quite literally in terms of reducing um, premium um, in the past so very good practice that we're keen to follow. Any, any further qu questions on that item? Ian? Just really minor, but uh, on page 268, the substitute member, I could have sworn my colleague, Councillor Joe Otten, said he would, who did a spell on the committee, said he would be the reserve. I just wonder if democratic services have, that the council have not got round to notifying. I'll put that up. So I'll have it in there if he, as far as it's my recollection, okay. he, he did. I, I'm not absolutely certain that it went through <coughs> now, but should have done. And he's the whip as well, so he's meant to. Thank you, Councillor Auckland. Any, any further questions on this item or comments? Uh, I, I guess just in general, I mean, it's, a, it's a gain, I feel. Well, there's all this work gone into this, and not had too many questions. I take the fact not too many questions shows how much effort and work and actually attention has been paid to the suggestions that have been made over the years uh, to improve the reporting. Because a lot of, you know, it's changed a lot and we've gone into a lot more detail, so thank you very much. Thank so, you. So just Paul. one final thought for me. I think it's great that the com committee does a degree of introspection in terms of looking at the way it operates but could we ask our uh, external observers too for their views i mean i know i know as part of the external audit and to a certain extent internal audit when you're looking at assurance frameworks 
you look at how effective the controls work. But I just wonder if perhaps for the future we need to incorporate some external views on how we're doing as a committee. I'm not going to put our external guests on the spot now, but maybe that's something we could consider for the future. Yeah, yeah that sounds a, a good idea to me. And we, we've recently gone through a churn of, of, of auditors, so I, I doubt our external auditors have had a lot of time to form an opinion <laughs> yet. Internal audit have only had a year, but I think as they both get their feet under the table and become more experienced, it would be good to include them in the in the surveys of because you do get a, v a very good lens on how audit committees work and how they compare to other people's audit committees from, from attending the, the significant number of committees that will attend. So views from them both via the usual sort of questionnaires and anonymised before they come here so we can't take revenge on them would be, <laughs> would, would be, would be useful. <laughs> could, could arrange that, please, Glenn. Wondering, Paul, if you wanted 360 feedback and then <laughs> the, the, the string in, that would probably be disastrous. So, yeah, that's not. I thought we'd got a new collective noun then for a churn of auditors. <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with this sort of, in a sense. There was a time when my old employer, East Nat West, went for all this 360 degree stuff. It didn't end well, if I recollect. <laughs> You, but we, we promise to take feedback as well in the spirit in which it's given and be open and accepting of any improvement points. So do feel free to feedback freely and fully in due course. Uh, next item, Claire, I think this might be it for you. Yes, the finale. <coughs> <laughs> this is the um, work plan and we've included the proposed work plan for 24-25. Since we published this, we will now supplement it with um, the internal audit um, reporting, and we can plumb that into the right, <laughs> plug that into the right sessions, um, and also the to reflect the reporting that SIFTA that we heard about earlier that SIFTA will do into this committee as well. So I'll add those in um, to the next version of this. So it's just if committee's got any feedback or think anything's missing or needs amending. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, just one or two from me, which I, I might have, getting a bit tired by the time we got to page 309, so I might have missed things. Um, do, do we need an item for external audits, annual audit letter for 2223? I was going to say ISA 260, but if they're not doing any opinion work, we probably won't get an ISA 260 from, from them. Um, and similarly, can you check with the incoming external auditors on their items whether they need an ISA 260 in this? over this time period or annual audit letter. And I couldn't immediately spot that, I think we need a Treasury Management final report for the year as well to come here, don't we? I know, I know we get, in my view, a lot of Treasury Management reports, but they're all statutory required reports to this committee. So one at the start of the year, a mid-year one, and one at the end of the year all need to be in. So can you just double check with, with Simon we've got everything of those in? Yep. Thank you. Any, any comments from other people? Paul. Thank you. Just a suggestion for the committee. Um, should we have a look at how we're doing on our progress to net zero? Because that's one of our biggest risks, I think, that we've got on the risk register. Uh, and perhaps allied to that, I don't know if Gareth wants to make any <coughs> comments on um, our um, ESG reporting. Um, if there's any issues there that we need to pick up. Um, at, on net zero, um, it, there is an external sort of review of our approach to net zero being undertaken at the moment. So it might be sensible that when that's complete, we'll bring that through. Um, it, it is a prominent issue on our risk register. So if we follow up at that point, um, I probably need to have a think about the ESG point. Um, if I could come back to you, if we put it on us to update verbally, yeah, next time, Claire. I, I did have one point for um, committee members, if I, if I could. You've obviously been receiving um, a lot of updates on the major change projects that will begin to conclude um, probably by the time we, we next come together in July. So I guess it's um, our committee members comfortable that say tram stops being a, a standing item for an update and gets rolled off into transport working group risk update and then goes on to the internal audit plan and same with OPCC which 
will have passed the integration point um, and that will roll forward again into the internal audit plan. Th thanks, Gareth. My, my, my instinct is we need, um, yes, we need to take them off the programme at some point. I, I think I'd like a, a one or two post-implementation routine reporting before we roll them off. So, you know, how's it, how's it gone for TRAM? How's it gone for OPC implementation? And that certainly in July. And, and you know, unless you're saying everything's gone marvellously and it's clear, perhaps the following one in September, then yes, we could do with anything we do to slightly slim down this this agenda would be great. So we don't want to continue them as standing items, but I think it's normally good practice to have a little bit of post implementation reviewing and and review of how it's gone and lessons learned um, until until we just sort of forget about them. So I'd like them just a little bit longer, please. I, I'm, Welcome to take views from other people. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's there's always a project close gap meeting, isn't there? Um, and if that's what we have for the tram, and hopefully everything's gone successfully at two o'clock this Friday morning, uh, we, we, we can look at that. I think, really, from my involvement with that project, I think there's a lot of lessons there we can learn for bus franchising and other projects that we might undertake uh, because. They have gone through it in remarkable detail. You know, when you take on something like this, it's right down to who's got the keys for the building, do we know the pass codes, etc., to get in a building once someone's left it to us. Uh, so I, I think perhaps one close down meeting would be useful, or close down report would be useful. Thank you. I, even if it's it's not the detail of the nuts and bolts and who you know who got the keys to the building, but it's just a you know, these are the summaries on 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 the process that we, we we will follow next time we do it, and this is the bits and bobs we've learned just to have something, some assurance over. The, we're an audit committee, some assurance over the process for learning the lessons over the project so far. You know, is in place and has been taken for the next ones, rather than the actual operational stuff, which is not necessarily uh, our role. Okay, thank you. That's the, the work plan then. And then Gareth, verbal one on breach of internal controls. Report. I take it this is okay in public? Yeah, there's uh, no, no breaches this, um, this reporting cycle. Thank you. And the final item's down for me, which is issues, issues for escalation. I think other than we've had a couple of, or at least one request for further information, which has been picked up and some other bits and bobs, there isn't anything we're escalating to board at this meeting, unless I've missed anything. So there's nothing at all there. And I, I sorry, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to Claire for doing six items in a row. And, and yes, as other people have said, I think the clear reporting has managed to minimise the, the questions on that. So, so thank you very much. And to everyone else, we've managed to get through a lot of work in the time scale. Mike, did you want to say something? Yeah, it was just um, in terms of um, requests for information, uh, Paul asked a question under item 19, Treasury Management Strategy, which was around parent company guarantees. I stand corrected, there have been, I believe, two requests for PCGs. The procurement lead responded to both people who um, were satisfied with his answer, having provided them with the standard response that it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the MCA. This is some background on the MCA and um, the tram system, and they were satisfied with those responses, so we haven't actually needed to provide a PCG. Right, thank you everyone. And it's week, on my sheet it says the next meeting is Wednesday 17th July at 10am. Is the 10am correct? We don't normally start at 10am. I think um, because of the amount of time that the meetings um, have been taken, um, I've extended them from 10am to 1pm. Right, so okay, yeah, so, so the 10am is correct then and we'll, we'll need a pre-meeting with the auditors at 9.30, will we? I shall get them booked in. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Then. Right, well, thank you very much, everyone, for your contributions. And I shall see most of you, but sadly not all of you, um, again on the 17th of July. Cheers. <laughs>